Sorry, hello everybody. My name is Kai Costantini. I'm uh, speaking to you from Treaty 1 territory in, in Winnipeg, Canada, Manitoba. Um, I'm very glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I would like to frame my talk because I'm not a biohacker per se. I'm more biomimetic. And uh, my what I'm going to present today comes from a little bit follow up from last year. But the, um, the initial idea is um, what you guys all experiment with at a molecular level with uh, uh, high carpet, so expensive material sometimes, unless you can build your bioreactors. I'm looking to uh, help general public uh, get an understanding and appreciation of how nature builds. And for that, I've prepared a presentation and I'm going to put it in big slide view. Tell me if that looks okay and you can see it all right. Okay, so we will be building. Does everybody have their uh, masking roll tape or something like that? Do you, do you have that? Can, nobody can see me, yeah? And a pair of scissors would be helpful. So I jump right in. So this is what it looks like. And it's, as I said, an attempt at uh, having a low uh, floor, high ceiling approach to, um, to enabling general publics to get a better idea of how nature builds. And um, uh, it's not wet lab, uh, things I do with this, but I'm looking to build also uh, more awareness for sustainable relationships towards materials, uh, helping us to shift our, our way we see and handle things and uh, create biomaterial literacies. So this is from a course I've taken with uh, Professor Fratzel from the Humboldt University and the Max Planck Institute. And he this slide he uses to introduce the uh, select few um, uh, materials nature uses and in, in in the basic there are three mineral sugar and protein and obviously you can decline them further from the biochemistry um, point of view and you can see nicely what they would look like in which type of microorganism or structure you can find them and i think it's uh, another attempt of my work is to try to sorry bridge uh, those scales a little bit and make all this what's happening at the micro scale more tangible and hopefully somehow translate it uh, uh, at, a, at a different scale uh, um, by using our hands to build things so the other uh, thing i want to do is draw a bridge between inuit material use and i'm here in winnipeg where we just opened our inuit uh, art gallery and so i'm looking to draw uh, on hopefully uh, an understanding of knowledge uh, and knowledge systems and uh, also build bridges there with what I'm trying to accomplish, but more about that later. So uh, what happens with biomaterials, they're often fiber-based and um, they initially make us, with our Western understanding of science, believe that um, that is a disadvantage. However, because fibers are strongly anisotropic, that means they, um, uh, they're uh, sorry, the, the weight or the strength comes or the toughness comes from how it's organized and arranged uh, with respect to the direction of the materials. Uh, it actually turns off now to be an uh, advantage, especially because it goes across hierarchies. So this is something I guess most of you uh, and in the public uh, here at the summit are much more um, uh, familiar with than I am. This has been my huge learning curve. So how does this uh, singular uh, polypeptide chain, uh, which is one dimensional and obviously at an ultra scale become or uh, uh, something which I can grasp or uh, a chitin uh, um, exoskeleton of an insect or how can this become our bone um, and this is what I'm trying to um, facilitate using masking uh, tape and tapigami so uh, obviously we have those bonds which are built and the uh, chains connect by um, bonds and there is a lot of biophysics uh, physics and chemistry involved in this which I do not really want to go into details and it's not my strengths I'm sure many of you are much better uh, with respect to that than I am but looking at this slide you can already see that you have initially obviously the polypeptide change which then folds uh, combines and connects and then somehow becomes a fiber which then is arranged in 3d um, structures and we have here the the rotated plywood or what they call bulligan structure which uh, is responsible for incredible toughness in many natural materials so this is how i translate this and i'm going 
before we start building, I'm going to go through a couple of stages because I can't uh, do this together with us uh, uh, at the same time. So this is how I uh, symbolize how we go from the single sort of uh, um, chain, which is symbolized on that uh, masking tape, to something like beta sheets, which are uh, assembled on the right side. And then uh, we have here the alpha helix and on the right the beta sheet again. And obviously we can imagine that I can twist the uh, masking tape into an alpha helix as well. So that's that's sort of an idea how I uh, in, introduce how you can go from the single to the um, beta screen to the helix and the beta sheets and then the assembly of beta sheets um, which uh, you will see, sorry, in the following, yeah, but a little bit down here where we have the coils and extended beta sheet and a cross beta sheet. So when there is um, one factor of strength and toughness I explain uh, with this top part, which I'll go into in a little bit later, where we can see that when uh, stress is exerted upon one of those chains um, or connection of chains, then um, they, they split again. Uh, and that's, well, I think my slides are a little bit of an upset. And then the next one is uh, coils. Uh, sorry, how we can get uh, to coils, which I can obviously do manually uh, with kids or other people in a general public um, uh, through this process here. And in a short while, I'll show you how we start making these type of shapes with um, with uh, masking tape. So this is where we start. If you don't mind, I'm going to, to sh stop sharing for a second and I go back in a short while because nature obviously aggregates and scales using um, using uh, aggregation and so there's a lot of repetition and what we do but i needed to work whilst i will continue and uh in a I'll stop sharing and I teach you how to do this and then you continue working that's what we need to do right to replicate whilst i uh, will share again and then we um and then we'll we'll start the second part okay so what i do with these is we want the um we want to build this type of uh, rolled up tapes you saw there these uh, tubes right but the important thing is that you need to have the tape inside out so the sticky part gets on the outside and then you start rolling the top and start making tubes and it doesn't matter you take it as an angle can be very tight but whatever you can manage can be 45 degrees start rolling uh, the sticky parts onto itself, right? Can you see that good enough, Salem? How does it look? Okay. Can you see that? Yeah, okay. okay. So you continue rolling until you get this type of uh, cone and or tube and make a couple of these as long as you want. And actually at this stage, we're absolutely not worried about how it looks, neither about any of the uh, widths or diameters. And obviously later, if you start stacking and uh, combining these uh, there is a difference so i i'm going to stop this i just put it off if you want to put it you just stick it onto um, a surface a laminated surface or something uh, i sometimes stick it on the wall but the paint comes off so <laughs> just careful where you put it no hairy body parts either and uh, and just keep on rolling a couple of those because obviously as i mentioned before nature aggregates and uh, so we need plenty of these yes i see very nice big tape there with romain <laughs> that's often easier that's right i'm going to check a little bit what the others do there if anybody has it in no we all have the cameras off well anyone who sort of uh, wants to show what he is up to let me know so continue doing a couple of those because as i just um so we need to stack them if you think about the plywood right uh, the rotated plywood if we want to do something like that, we need quite a few, right? And we continue rolling and it's fastidious because uh, that's what it is in nature too, right? <laughs> so I don't want to make it easy on you, um, but usually that's where the group kicks in and I'm going to start sharing again in five seconds because if you do this in a group, obviously you can um, have more volume faster and that's the idea okay and then obviously combining as well so i've got three and i prepared obviously a couple and then we'll see how we move onwards from there and what we managed to do so i'm gonna share again and you can please all continue to make those tubes as many as you want there and if they have different diameters it doesn't matter okay i'm, I'm sorry I, I missed the beginning yes like okay the you started to roll on. Yes, okay, just a second. 
I, I do mine is, is, is wider than yours, so it might not work. Uh, exactly. Roma, it doesn't matter. Yes, okay. If you do, I can take a wider one, and maybe you can see this better than guys, right? Yeah. The sticky side outside. Alors, Roma, uh, ah, français, okay. si tu veux. Alors, okay. le, la partie collante à l'extérieur. So the, okay. the sticky part on the outside. And okay. you, you, you have the non-stick part inside the tube. Okay, and the beginning is not always easy. You just start one way or another, just start rolling it. Okay, and for the sake of I'm turning it around now, I have the sticky part to myself and then roll it backwards. It's easier for me, others do it differently. Okay, once you just it doesn't matter how it looks like, so the top, whatever it is, just as long as you get start rolling there. Okay, and then we want to have a couple of those I showed in the last slide. Like, and even now, just make some, they don't have to be long, just make a few that you that we at least can try and aggregate a little bit. So I'm sharing my screen again. Okay. That's what I want to do. Okay, can you see that slide again? Yeah, okay. So uh, I put my keyboard somewhere, I have to find it. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Oh, wait, you don't, you still don't see, do you see my, um, can you just tell me if you see my screen, Salem? Yes, yes. Okay, you're, you're, thank you. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So if I move now, it's, okay. So this obviously, that's the one I wanted to show you earlier on. Uh, it was on one of the pictures before, let's go back. That's when you have uh, some uh, uh, beta sheets connected and uh, there are nanocrystals in between. And uh, when force or stress happens, then they can split because of their arrangement, right? And that sort of creates this, uh, a resistance and a toughness, which makes the material incredibly, um, uh, yeah, resilient, I guess, right? So I'm going back to, that's what I was trying to do at the top here, the top left, if you see that, right? So I take actually one of those rolls we're just doing and then I, I unravel the ends and I, I fold the inner bits together. So that's a way of simulating that for me, okay? We can get a little bit later, this is what I meant there, okay? That's one of the things I do with those tubes to, um, to um, symbolize uh, that type of folding. Okay, so now we're back to these um, arrangements nature does so well. So let's pretend we just made one filament, which is not true with one fibril, <laughs> because uh, actually in order to get to one fiber, we would have to stick one of those rolled bits we just made in the middle and then arrange at least three to four or five around it to say we have one fiber. That's the step I sort of omit. We have one logical step I will omit, <laughs> okay? Because we will say that those tubes we just made, yeah, uh, they are the fiber and instead of being A, uh, they are uh, already um, the, the, the B part you can see in the fibril plane, yeah? We don't have this combination. I, I hope that's clear <laughs> because obviously we wouldn't be able to do all this. And um, so the idea then would be to, to stack those in the plane first to create the fibril plane, right? And, and then uh, experience the differences between what a rotated uh, or bulligant array raiment is or a unidirectional array and then uh, go through all those phases uh, which allow for a combination and aggregation of those tubes. And that's something very hard for us to do right now because I usually count on the group and I would like to experiment with a group, but COVID hasn't helped, right? <laughs> to obviously aggregate those tubes and get us to, to be able to simulate this type of arrangements which we find at the, uh, in, in the chitin or uh, to a certain extent in, in bone, in bone, um, bone growth as well. So this is how I simulate that and we will, um, do some of those in a, in a short while, okay? Once you've built up a little bit of a stack, <laughs> okay? So another one just to look at is here is the, how it's done with bone, for instance, and bone obviously also has different types of um, growth phases. Uh, if it has to repair or heal itself, it will have a different kind of uh, structure than what it has when it's uh, uh, the dense growth, the regular growth or something like that uh, in the beginning. And there are different ways how nature then will help uh, uh, um, the uh, the hydroxypartite or the mole here's the molecules which are reinforced with hydroxypartites or minerals, um, how it will allow them to um, um, grow 
uh, fast as opposed to then more structured. So it's poorly ordered for the fast growth. That's what I'm trying to say. And then under, um, under the last two, it would be highly ordered for um, more structured growth, which is a regular normal growth when there was no no um, um, no, no damage. Okay, so same thing on the left of this slide. Uh, we have what we just saw. What time is it? Sorry, how am I doing for time? Okay, I can. I still have a little bit of time. And there is a question there in the chat. I don't see that right now. But just look at the left side. Same thing, which I just walked you through from the uh, sort of uh, polypeptide strains and molecules, collagen molecules. To I didn't go into because this is born into how the minerals stack into the into this fabric uh, to the fibrils and then to lamella lamella units, which is something I would like us to sort of assemble now. Um, we can let me just see where I'm going from here. This is what I'd like us to build now. So if you have a pair of scissors, you can start cutting same length um, parts of the tubes, and I don't know well, take. Maybe four or three is fine, just for the principle of it. Uh, same and uh, build sort of layers with the same lengths for that. And then we can, this is just a summary of all those we saw. As you can see, I, I use the same technique with the same tube for this. And then this is just a summary for all of you to see what type of uh, lengths or scales we are playing with and trying to bridge and obviously science also has a lot of trouble to bridge all those <laughs> with the technology we have and we want to do this just symbolizing at a macro scale okay so and i'm this is what i'm going to end with but uh, before i do that i'll stop sharing and we build those uh, structures we just saw i'll just go back one time to show you what we are looking for we want to start making a fibral plane and then start trying to, to do the bulligant uh, structure, okay? Any questions so far? I'm going to stop sharing. And there was half an hour left. Okay, well, that's good. We have time <laughs> to play. <laughs> I think I'll end before time and we can discuss. So if you are ready, I'll just go to do this and just we, we start, see whether we can come up. And it would be nice if we could stick ours together then, would go faster. So I'm putting a couple of these together. Can you see this now or? Yes. Okay, I'm putting, so I have more and now I forgot my scissors. <laughs> Let me see whether I have one here. And I'm the one who came non-prepared. I didn't bring my scissors. Okay. So if you can just maybe, I'll, I'll use my hands for now. So I can just make same lengths. Since I didn't make them so, so thick I can do this and usually I do things which are much larger than this, this is very small for me <laughs> and uh, and then I can maybe also show you how I actually do those spirals and what I'm interested with is spirals as well so I just cut them off and if you have a scissors you can do it neatly right and this is why I like the tapigami because I wouldn't be able to model that with anything else right how should I model those bonds and I don't like I don't want an expensive kit for this either I want this to be as democratic as it can be um, so now I have some sort of first layer right I guess everybody of you now understands how fastidious this is, which is why I like it that we start with really building up this and we don't have a kit, right? So we, we have to really do the whole process from hand. So I have one layer, right? And I would have to I have more of these prepared here. So I can do I stick them on the walls. <laughs> so I can do another layer, right? And then we can start try and rotate and uh, use different angles to combine those. Oh. I should have brought my scissors. <laughs> the host is unprepared. Sorry about that. Okay, so I have a badly made second layer, right? Which I then would stick sort of in a first layer, slightly offset to get some sort of, uh, you know, um, helical form forming there, right? Because uh, most of you might know that anyways, from the nature likes those helical structures, starting with the helical form of the DNA, but it goes through all everything she builds. So these plywoods then are actually built and laid upon each other, uh, these layers in a um, helical structure, right? So you start rotating those around 
And once again, coming back, as you can see now, what I want to get at something which I would like with those public uh, communities I want to do this with, right, is that it's really fastidious. It's a fastidious process because I have to, you know, build the material myself uh, from this single strip and then roll. It's a lot of work. And the only thing to help us out and advantage we have there for sure is that we can uh, combine the numbers, right? We are lots of people and, um, and we can then make it faster because we can combine what we do together in our, our groups. So this is one of those structures, right? The other thing you can do was what I showed you before is I can start folding them halfway. Don't scotch it all exactly over each other. And then we can get this uh, arrangement we had before. And I, I start, I can start unraveling this here. Sorry, I'll take a longer one I have over here. Uh, I'll take a longer one. So we can. And since it this is nice and I can get it into the hands of like people who have not a lot of dexterity, younger ones, older ones, and I can do it ad hoc on the spot. And I can I then open this again here, for instance, to unravel, which would be something, you know, which happens when there's strain up oh, this start of unravels again. And that way I can simulate some of those properties, anisotropic properties. And, uh, and that's how I sort of play around with this. Now, another thing I do, and that's, I'll show you the this how to do maybe one of those as well. And what's the time? We still have a couple of minutes. So this is um, how I do the helices. Obviously, I have a couple of, um, I can't um, be true to nature because the helices in the end, hi, somebody playing with us there. <laughs> no, the helices, fantastic. The helices actually become a stiffer part in the material and uh, mine right now. And yeah, Shaz, I would like to say that. So I'll show you how I do this and what I like about them. I'll show you first as well, because lots of those DNA, and even if you make a DNA example, for instance, from um, origami, they are more rigid and uh, I don't have the uh, things which are important with respect to the base pairs and chromosomal things, but I can do play around with this to sort of unravel. And then inside this for me is part of wonder, right? I don't want definite answers there. I hope that our knowledge evolves and that we bridge, bridge as well with what other uh, forms of knowledge can be. And so I can twist this and it gives an idea how, for instance, proteins sort of you know, uh, can fold or connect. So this is a little bit what I like with that. And um, so my issue here obviously is chirality, but I can get people to get the chir chirality, right? Do you say chirality in English? I do not know, sorry. <laughs> but obviously we can play, I think if I'm not mistaken, the collagen molecule, for instance, uh, it goes right for the initial coils and then left for the other two. I'm not sure I can manage that yet, but we can, uh, simulate the coiling nicely and the understanding that, you know, you have one coil that it can be really condensed and unraveled and then they coil around each other for play and fun. You know, I can vary my colors. We can get those other sort of uh, type of masking types online. And then we can, you know, try and find a way to see how this sort of connects. And, and for me, the idea really is that people play around with these processes, right? So that we do not stop at thinking it's a DNA code or we know everything about it. There is reason to wonder about how nature does this across scales and these principles she uses. So you can, this one coils nicer, okay? So I also like the fact that it's elastic and things. And now I'll show you how I, I do one of these. So running out of samples, I guess. So one of those tubes here, if you've made them a little bit larger, you obviously that's it. I fold that in the middle. I fold it flat, completely flatten it yeah, until the end. And then I sort of half it because it starts giving it tension and doing this actually also gives an idea how these things, you know, happen in nature. You get a better understanding of what the tension and the pressure and things like is, which often with other kits and models you don't get, right? You just sort of are stuck with a chemistry model. And uh, that was my initial critique <laughs> amongst other things. 
So before, so I made it half size and it's obviously stiffer, right? But we still can see that it's been rolled up into this shape. It's, it's sort of the process is still very close to uh, how nature gradually makes us and it's fastidious and it should be <laughs> okay so i'm not making this easy i don't want a kid i don't want this easier i want people to experience this and i hope that it helps us to get a better understanding of what nature does so this is my outside of one of those spirals right so it's stronger you can feel it okay it's still nice and sticky because obviously we have the sticky side outside and now in order to get more of the inside i usually and that's where i really need my my scissors i can gun, run up and get some maybe okay <laughs> i'll show it to you like this i i put a couple of these i cut them in half and i stick them together with different diameters and then i start making this type of stuff yeah so this is just cutting uh sorry cutting along the along the first line here you cut slices tiny slices and you start putting those together in the plane right and then i stick those to the inside of one of those i make a second one stick it to the other side i unfold this one you can see that and then i have this sort of interior and exterior and then i can roll all this okay so it's a little bit of an idea how nature does this and this is all is this can you see that that gives me the cellular sort of tissue inside and that's just a, it's obviously now we're in the realm where we're not scientifically correct but i think that can all be explained okay as for me i think it's still sufficient to allow to experiment and experience and wonder and uh, and then the scientific part sort of can be gradually built back into that so yeah go ahead anybody yeah it, it looks like you're you're kind of uh, doing uh, data visualization you could do that with this kind of thing like uh, you see what i mean like uh, it's a uh, it's kind of physical data nice yeah I think that, yeah some people actually have a, a, a some kind of website where they they regroup every uh, physical data visualization that you can find and uh, i guess you if you if you've not done it yet uh, there is a path okay. yeah please yes give me a give me hints put me a link absolutely yeah. fascinated because it's I, true i i have a, i've just presented folding as a growth as a complex growth principle at the complexity weekend uh, with guys from the santa fe complexity institute last week actually and uh, and we play a lot there is a group of us who really want to play around with uh, uh, we use crotcheting and fiber arts for that and i that's something you know i the the reason i use tapigami and i might make that clear as well is because trying because obviously there's fiber behind it so you could use yarn and the assembly of yarn as a symbolic as well but in the end it, it, it's much harder for general publics and even younger people how can i do this i mean it just really doesn't work that well i find as a as a material reasoning tool and a, and a symbolic uh, thing there because people need more dexterity so that's my point there okay fantastic thanks for the link uh, roma i really appreciate that i'm definitely going to check it out because that's a lot of things i'm into as well <laughs> so coming back to my slides and sort of i'm starting to wrap up i mean if you I, because I mislaid my, uh, and I don't want to run up now <laughs> to get my scissors, but if you have this uh, strong part, as I said, make two of these and then start cutting, uh, you know, at, at the front here, bits and pieces, stack them together so that you get some sort of cellular fabric in the plane, which looks like this, and stick them in between those two stronger, uh, um, nah, uh, stronger, mm, uh, whatever we call them now, I don't know, uh, reinforced fibers. <laughs> And, uh, and then start, you know, then you can start uh, making wonderful spirals, right? I think we all love those. And they look like the tendrils as well of plants and etc. So there's lots to do, lots to play around with. And uh, I, what I'll do now is I'm going to share again because I also have, as I said, this other objective. And I want to explain a little bit more of that to link it to indigenous uh, knowledge and uh, to uh, hopefully bridge something there. And I'd like to, to give a couple of screens or slides on, on that. Okay. So I think 
building wise it's all we can do because we're not in a room and unfortunately i haven't been able to stack all this <laughs> for inspiration show me what you can do guys right and then send me pictures because if we were in a room we could more easily stack and fast get to the helical arrangement there and then obviously e becomes even more uh, challenging okay so and now it's okay it works okay so this is bones used in inuit art and i have this museum which finally opened uh, with delays during covid and i finally visited so you can see how lovely uh this whale bone is used uh in this piece of art and that's where i'd like to sort of you know bridge and see how i can uh start building awareness between a different kind of way of using uh, biomaterials how it's been used traditionally hopefully bridge the scales we have in the Western scientists with uh, knowledge which comes from uh, indigenous uh, knowledge systems. This is a group I'm sort of connected with and hopefully can do this with. I re they just formed the, the community of practice in the University of Manitoba and the federal Canadian government, where they've been asking questions how they can braid their knowledge system into modern and Western sciences. Uh, if you see that indigenous knowledge is something new or Western science. Um, and I very much hope that we can move together towards something new because I think we all know that our sciences have limitations as well. Okay, so and this is something I wanted to share. It's uh, one piece of art out of this new exhibition in my local gallery. It's called To, to Draw Water. And Isa, Isabel Birch, uh, this is an international group of artists, indigenous artists from across the world. Um, made this installation on a, um, it's a video installation on a satellite dish and I thought it was fantastic because she actually puts the, uses it to project the waves and the waters uh, of the oceans on it and I thought that this is already one of those signs where I think and I hope we can bridge more of this different knowledge um, into what the Western uh, knowledge represents and I'm going to end here with the last slide if you so a couple of other images in that direction uh, Jesse Tunlik is seal skin a space boot and then uh, on the right we have a map for um, I think it's either currents or ice formed uh, I'm not too sure anymore but the other right, right is on bark with um, a map to read uh, natural uh, territory okay so thank you very much if you have questions and you want, want to try something else we can do this now if there's some time left otherwise uh, i think i'm finished with my presentation today and it was really fun doing this together with you did i stop sharing i did yes thank good. you so much uh that was very cool very fun I don't, okay I mean, Good. I good. unfortunately didn't have the uh, masking tape. I'm using uh, scotch tape, <laughs> which was a little challenging. Very hard, myself, very but, hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I had another attendant doing that last week as well. He had scotch tape and the other some had duct tape. So that really makes it hard if you can. And that's actually another analogy I really like by using this material. It's uh, get the one which is the least, uh, you know, uh, strong, uh, which has the most paper. So the least uh, not very um, not toxic to the environment. So least plastic uh, because uh, some of them have plastic in it. So and that works the best. So thank you so much for your time, guys. Yeah. Ah! These <laughs> like somehow are making nice. you talk on it. Yeah. Fantastic! I can see you doing that very well. Somebody was inspired there. That's good. Can, <laughs> do you want to try and turn this around as well? Like, can you try and do this? Oh yeah, that's a nice one. Very nice one. Fantastic. Yeah, try with that one. Yeah, do you want to make a helis or a spiral? What do you think, Elisa? Yes. 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 <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Very good pronunciation. <laughs>
So any other questions or anybody who tried and had a problem or anything? Hi, Kay. Um, I tried and it worked pretty well, but then when I was cutting them, they all kind of became squished. And I wonder if you have a solution for that. That's, that's, I know. The, the squishing is fine because we're doing two different things, right? So, the, and actually, to be honest, I really like it for that. That's why it shows that I'm so happy with it. And I'm far from having finished to, to explore what we can do with this because, I mean, that's how it's in Asia. And that's usually what I find is a critique uh, for me to most of the science kits we have, you know, because they are static, right? And for me, that is a living way so what i was showing were two different things so this where, where it shouldn't be really uh, squished that's the plywood when we sort of stack them right and then we want if we can in a group come to the helical uh, structure that's not the same as what i'm trying to do when i do these and that's when it's nice when they can be squished right because that's exactly i mean it, it, you mu in order to make them in a plane they sort of have to be a little bit uh, same lengths, right? So yours are very large. That might be hard to put in a plane between these two, right? I'm, I'm, if I open this, this is what it really looks like here, right? So you put those two um, ones here, uh, the, the stronger folded ones at the end bits. This part I can easily turn and then I sort of decided to do something completely different because I have uh, planes with cellular grows in all sorts of ways, which are one meter long with these things as well. But what I'm trying to do here, this is just for the coiling of the collagen molecule, for instance, or the protein in, at some point, right? Or the DNA, and now I broke it as well because I've been using it for a long time as a sample. <laughs> but uh, but this is the type of plane I meant initially, so that should be squished, no? That's exactly, I'm happy about that. The only thing I can see with you is I would cut that much, I would slice it more, I would even cut through that one more time or something like that. But you can play around with that. You can, you know, this is now really in the realm of playing. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. And as the title says, we are going to learn how to clean Sanger sequences with free software, free gap and gap. So let's go. This workshop has the theory part and the workshop itself. So let's go with the theory first. When we are talking about DNA sequencing, we are referring to the determination of the sequence of a DNA molecule. Historically, DNA has had a lot of methods to be studied uh, by molecular markers such as FLLP, CAPS, or RADP. However, the ability to see nucleotide by nucleotide given by sequencing has been a huge advance compared with gel analysis. So uh, let's see why. Uh, sequencing is important in the, the DIY bio community. For example, in the field of genetic engineering, it's crucial to confirm that the DNA used is the one that was designed at the first place. So from all of the sequencing technologies, Sanger sequencing is still widely used for small DNA fragments and even in some cases for a uh, whole plasmids. But some, uh, most of the software require a payment in order to clean sequencing obtained at this Sanger. So in this workshop, we are going to learn, learn how to use this free starting package uh, to avoid to pay um, for, for this work. So we are going to learn more about Sanger sequencing. When people talk about Sanger sequencing, they are referring the most of the time of the manual way to do it. But it is also important to know that it is um, an automated way to do it too. So these two methods follow three basic steps. The first one is the DNA sequence for change termination PCR. The second, site separation. And the third one is the analysis and determination of DNA sequence. So we are going to see each one of these. The first one, DNA sequence for change termination PCR. In the manual way, there are four PCR reactions, one for each type of DD NTP. In contrast, in the automated way, there is just a single reaction because in this reaction, there is the four DD entities that has a unique first and label. So in this PCR, we have our template, the primer, polymerase and cofactors, the entities, and this modified DD entities. When one of the, these uh, molecules attaches the um, newest Trend, the polymerase can continue, so the reaction is truncated. That's why the product of this reaction is uh, are different strains 
uh, strands depending on their size. Uh, um, now, the second step is size separation. In the manual way, the oligos from the each four PCRs are run in four separate lines uh, of a gel. This allows the user to know which oligos corresponds to each DDNTP. And in the automated way, all of the oligos are run in a single capillary gel electrophoresis within the sequencing machine. And the third and last step is the determination of DNA sequence. So in the manual way, the user reads all the four lines of the gel at once, moving from the bottom to the top, using the line to determine the identity of the terminal DDNTP for each band. For example, in this gel, if the bottom band is found in the column corresponding to DDGTP, then the smallest PCR fragment terminates in DDGTP. So the first nucleotide of, uh, of the sequence will be aguanine, and we can continue like that. For example, if the second bottom band is found in the column corresponding or, uh, so sorry, our connection is unstable. So I don't know if, if, in which part I <laughs> I talk about. You only missed about a minute, uh, Claudia. Okay, so. Sorry. Uh, Same slide, I think. So I think you're fine. I'm gonna share this again. Okay, uh, just tell me in which of the is like, I mean, okay, I don't know what happened. Uh, okay, uh, you hear me in this slide? Yep. Yes, thank you. Yeah, okay. Just let me, one minute. Okay, so the third and last step uh, in this um, Sanger sequencing is the determination of the DNA sequence. So in the manual Sanger uh, sequencing way, the user has to read all of the four lines of the gel at once, moving uh, from the bottom to the top, using the line to determine the identity of the terminal DD uh, NTP. So for example, in this gel, uh, if the bottom band is found in the column corresponding to the TTGTP, then the smallest PCR fragment terminates with TTGTP. And the first nucleotide of the sequence will be a one and it's the same with all of the, the lines. So uh, in the automated way, uh, a static laser excites the passing oligos generating a different signal per type of DDNTP because each of one, uh, each of the four DDNTPs are tagged with a different source and level, label. So the light emitted can be directly tied to the identity of the terminal DDNTP. The output of this is an electrophorogram which shows the fluorescent peak of each nucleotide along the DNA template. So it's really important to know how to read Sanger sequencing results. You, um, you can sequence just with one of these primers, but it's, it's better if you sequence with both of the primers because you will receive two outputs, the one from the forward primer and the other one from the reverse primer. So in this case, the output will be the same sequence as the um, main strand. And in this case, uh, you should convert the output um, you should transform the, the output to the reverse complement to have this, the sequence of the main strand. So we will uh, compare these two sequences and have a double check. Okay, so now I'm going to talk to you about some advantages and drawbacks of standard sequencing. This will be very uh, quick so uh, we can go to the practical part and uh, learn how to use the software. So first, Sanger sequencing is a very fast process. It's cost effective for a low number of targets. With this, I mean when you want to sequence a few genes or a few promoters 
Um, it also has a very familiar workflow as we're going to see in, um, in, in some minutes. And it might be useful to sequence up to 1000 base pairs molecules. And as you know, some um, vectors have this size, so you can uh, sequence a whole vector, a whole plasmid with Sanger sequencing in some times. Then you have some drawbacks um, that these are not the only drawbacks of Sanger sequencing, but are the most important that, um, that we're going to see how to overcome these obstacles. So first it can sequence only short pieces of DNA as, as, a, as I told you before. Then the quality is not very good in uh, the sequence where the primer binds. This is very important to bear in mind and uh, when you want to design or to use primers in order to sequence a fragment of DNA. Then the quality of the sequence drops after uh, seven to 900 base pairs. And then you have, uh, when you have homopolymer sequences like the one uh, that I am signaling here, um, the, um, the, uh, when you have these kind of sequences, the reading might be affected because some enzyme slippage during the chain termination PCR. So what may happen is after this uh, homopolymer um, motif, um, there might be some um, ambiguous peaks or the general quality of the sequence is going to drop. So this is why using two primers to sequence one single sample is very useful. Um, we're going to see that here, um, but first we're going to see how do we prepare the sample for Sanger sequencing. So the, the way um, here we are going to present you is that you first uh, have to perform a PCR to amplify the desired segment of DNA that you want to sequence. This um, uh, might be an insert, a promoter, a plasmid, a, a CDS, etc. So here I uh, put you an image of um, some vectors, a vector that has DNA that has specific DNA sites for you to use some uh, primers that are very uh, often used to sequence the DNA of interest that is within a, a vector. So for example, here you have the M13 reverse and forward primers. Um, that as you can see, they are not inside the MCS, that is the, 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 DN, the part of the DNA of the vector where you put in your DNA of interest. They are flanking this side so that we don't uh, have the problem that the primer binds to the CDS or the DNA of interest and we are not going to have a good quality of those parts because as I've told you um, in the last slide, uh, the sequence is not very good uh, where the primer binds to the template DNA. So once you have your uh, isolated DNA that you want to um, sequence, <clears throat> you're going to, uh, optionally, you uh, want to purify the fragment. You, uh, to do this, um, you can run it in a, in a gel and then isolating the band that you are interested in and then use a a gel purification kit so that you get rid of primer dimers, primers that were not used in the, in the, in the reaction, uh, some of the protein of the enzyme, etc. So, but this is optional. Then you have to generate the order in the sequencing company. Here, the most important part in generating the order, there are several companies that perform Sanger sequencing, is that you have to determine or tell them how many primers do you want to use to sequence a determinate sample? So you can uh, sample one, you can sequence one sample with just one primer of or with two primers. As I told you before, it is better, it, uh, it's, it is very advisable to use two primers. So you can double check, we are going to see exactly what this means. Um, and you uh, should use like a forward and a reverse primer to do this, um, this ordering. Once you have the order ready, you have to ensure that the quality and the quantity of the sample of your PCR product is the one that is required that by the company. Usually um, companies require at least 10 microliters of the PCR product. And then you must attach additionally to the, um, to the 
um, to the sample, you have to attach uh, tubes with the primers that you want the company to use for uh, sequencing. So you have, if you stated that you are going to use two primers, you have to send additionally to the tube where there's the sample, one tube for the forward primer and one tube with, a, with an aliquot of the reverse primer. Then you have to label well the tube so that the company doesn't uh, miss the order and send that to the company and wait for the results. So the results come uh, to us in two, in two formats. So a file that is in the format of AB1 or ABI and a format of PDF. So the company sends you a, a format, one file of AB1 and one format of PDF per primer that you use. So if you wanted to um, sequence one fragment with two primers, you should receive two uh, files of, with the format AB1 or ABI and two uh, files with the format PDF. This is very important due to because uh, we're going to make an assembly in order to double check and to clean the sequence because we're going to see that the sequence that the, the, that the company uh, reports to us directly um, the raw sequence um, is not going to be um, real because it has some um, errors in the algorithm. So I'm going to talk to you about what is this AB1 or ABI files. So this, um, the AB1 or ABI files are um, a process data. So what does this mean? When the detector um, detects the, the fluorescent peaks in the um, in the gel electrophoresis in the capillary gel electrophoresis, it uh, gets this electrophorogram. So then they put this information through a base calling algorithm. That what it's going to be is that it's going to uh, um, um, relation. It's going to tie a, a nucleotide to each peak to each signal of different peak. And also it is going to give us a quality score of how clear was the peak. Um, so if there was noise, the quality is not going to be very good. And uh, this is this, um, this information that comprises the electrophorogram, the base calling and the quality scores is what is contained in the AB1 or ABI files that we are going to work with. So um, knowing this, uh, here it is what the software that we are going to use is going to do. So first, here is a graphic that represents all the pipeline that um, the software makes. So here in the first part, you can see um, how, the, uh, um, how the PCR, the chain termination PCR works. Uh, here in red are the primers. You can see here uh, in order for us to see how the information is going to be transformed. I put here a start codon and here I put it a stop codon. So here you have uh, the PCR and you get the sequences from that. As you can see, the polymerase always goes from the three prime sense to the, uh, sorry, from the five prime sense to the three prime sense. And this is how um, the, the company send us the sequences. They send us from the five prime to the three prime sense and for example, here you can see that the uh, TAA uh, in when you get the sequence of the company is read as ATT because it's in the uh, five prime to three, three prime um, sense. So what is going to what we're going to do to this data that is uh, delivered as in the AB1 files is that first the software what is going to do is that it is going to take one of the strands. Um, it is going to make the inverse of that strand. So this ATT uh, gets to TTA and this uh, GTA uh, is ATG. Uh, it just inverted the sequence. And then to the same sequence, the server is going to make the complementary uh, um, nucleotides. What we gain with this uh, fact, what we gain with this uh, process here is that we have um, a duplication of the information, but obtained with two different reaction of sequencing. So what we gain with this is that we can double check if the base calling of um, a sequence is correct or not. 
So for example, if here is a C, a, a peak of C that is very low and we're not quite sure that um, the base calling algorithm got right, we can double check in this other sequence here and we can see that it was not a mistake. It probably was a low, uh, weak um, peak and that's it. And we're going to see how this is uh, very useful because as, I, as I've said, the base calling algorithm usually makes a lot of um, mistakes and the, the raw sequence that you get in the PDF files or in the AV files um, are not the, the, the right ones for, for uh, some saying. Um, so let's going to do this as we put you in the chat. Um, you need to use the Staten package that should have been already installed. Uh, it is very easy to install. So it, I think this is being recorded. So uh, it, you can uh, rewatch the tapes if you want to do this and you don't have now the, the software. So um, just before starting, I want to show you um, what errors we might have to, uh, we might encounter. Um, so here, for example, you have uh, three examples, three different examples. This is one example, this is two, uh, the second sample, and this is the third example. Here you can see that, for example, <laughs> there is one sequencing of one primer, and there here is the sequencing of the other primer. This might be of the reverse, and this might be of the forward. So here you can see that the um, forward primer sequencing here, you don't have uh, much clear peaks. There's a lot of noise. The quality scores are, are not good. So you cannot rely on any of this information. You can only rely on the information that has got from the reverse primer sequencing. But here you have to be very careful where you don't have nothing to double check because although the peaks are very clear, the base calling algorithm might, might uh, make some mistakes. So for example, here, the base calling algorithm detected that here are five peaks of cytosine. Um, but um, if you see the electropherogram, you can only see that there are only four peaks of C. So you should remove one C because this is an error of the base calling algorithm. Here you have a similar case where um, this is not a real error that the basis algorithm committed, but might be an error because you have here a peak of G and a little peak of A here. And you might not be sure if this was an A or a G. So hopefully here you have, although unclear and with not very good quality scores, uh, a, um, a sequence that you can double check and you can see that, well, here it is a G and here, here it is also a G. And here you can see also that the base calling algorithm didn't detect this blue peak that corresponds to cytosine. So here you can see that the cytosine is very clear. So you can um, confidently say that there, it is, there is a C next to this G here. And then in the third example, we can see that um, this uh, software allows us to um, modify the electropherogram so that we can um, see better the, the signal peaks and we can make a better judgment on whether the base, uh, on whether you are uh, modifying good or you're not, uh, on whether you are doing well the cleaning of the sequence, yeah. That's what I wanted to say. So, um, I think someone's asking something in the chat. Um, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you don't need to uh, worry. I'm, I'm monitoring that and I'll ask if there's any questions that come up. Um, I'll, I'll make sure you get that so you can concentrate on speaking. By the way, okay. this is a fantastic overview. So thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so now what we're going to do, how do we? Um, we are going to start with the with the with the workshop itself. With the workshop itself. So we are going to share all of the screen. Just let us a couple of minutes. Okay. 
you're looking at my de desktop, right? Yeah. So um, first, we have to download the sequences that we all, that uh, we uh, put you in the Google Drive. Um, as I've told you, you can see this in in the recording, uh, but what you have to do is from the downloads, you have to put both sequences, the forward and the reverse uh, sequences, sequences of the same sample in one single folder. This is because the software is going to make an, a database of all the things, the transformation that the, the software makes, and it's going to um, be placing the files, the experiment files here in the, in the same folder. So once you have these two uh, these two sequence these two files ab1 files in the uh, in one folder you can start um, we can start with the process so first you have to go here and look for the first software that we are going to use that is called pre gap pre gap 4 so this is the 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 software that we are going to use it's it's named pre gap 4 if you install the CSTL package, you will not have the pre-gap. Yeah, you, you just have to install Staden and all the softwares are already installed. You just... In that package. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a whole package. You don't need to use and uh, not need to do nothing more. So you have to open the pre-gap software. And here you have to put the files that we are going to uh, clean. So first we have to go to the, um, to the file where we have um, the AB1 files. We select both at the same time, yeah? And then we have to place open, to click in open. So here the um, pre gap is going to uh, see where is the, folder of both um, of both files and it's going to make all the other files of the processing in the same file. Then we have to go to configure modules. Here is the all the features that this software has in order to um, make uh, a lot of stuff, a lot of science scientific stuff. Here not we're not going to go deeper in all these uh, features, but what we what I have to do here is we have to unselect these options, quality clip, sequencing vector clip, screen for unclip vector, and cloning vector clip. These features that I unselected are might be useful for people that um, sequence whole plasmids and they just want to look at specific parts of the plasmid. So if you, with these uh, uh, features that I unselected, if you provide to the software a file with the sequence of the vector that you used, the, the, the software is going to identify which of your sequence corresponds to the vector and which of the sequence corresponds to, to an insert or to a potential uh, point mutation or some something that might be wrong with the. Um, oh, there with it the is. Excuse me, just a quick question: Is this yeah. software only available for um, Windows, or is it available on Linux and Macintosh? It's available in Windows and Linux. And Mac and yeah. iOS. It's yeah, available. it is available. Thank you. Yeah. So. What uh, we should do next is that we select the GAP4 shotgun assembly. This is because we are going to make a contact with the both sequences we have of the same um, of the same uh, sample. Here we have to put the name of the sample. So I think the name of the sample was SO19. And we're going to create a new database. The new database is going to be created in the folder that we already uh, stated that uh, we're going to work. And you don't have to do more, you just have to put run. So the software is going to read the old information in the, in the AB1 files. With this, I mean the, the electropherogram, the peak signal, and the quality scores, yeah? So once we have this, we have to open the 
GAP software. So here in the search engine, you can put GAP4. This is the software where we are going to make the alignment and we're going to open this software. Here, what we, are, what we have to do is that we have to open the process data that the pre-GAP software did. So we're going to go to file, open, open. And here it uh, already puts you the, the file that has to be read, which is, sorry, which is in the um, format dot AUX. Okay, so you have to select this um, file. You open this file and here it opens all the information that the pre -cap could read from the AB1 files. And this, you can see these two lines, this one line separate in two, this, each of these lines correspond to the, the sequences of the forward and the reverse. Uh, this is the forward, the reverse sequencing, and this is the forward sequencing. And then what you have to do is that you have to go to view and put the option find internal joints. What are we going to do with this? We're going to make the reverse complement that uh, we, I told you in the slide and make an alignment so that we can double check more easier. But um, you are going to see that Sanger sequencing has a lot of problems in the, in the ends of the sequence. So the, the, the alignment might, be, might encounter some difficulties. So we have to state to the software that we want a very flexible alignment with whatever the software um, finds. So for that, we are going to put the, here in these uh, values, the minimum overlap to the minimum, that is 10, and the ma maximum percent mismatch to the 100%. So then we have to put here sensitive so that the algorithm also makes an alignment with whatever it, it encounters. And we're going to put that, I think that that's it. Yeah, that's it that we have to do here. So we're going to put okay. And here the software shows you all the alignments that they could make. Here you can see a line that goes from the top left to the bottom right, and a line that goes from the uh, bottom left to the upper right. So this line represents the alignment made with no modifications to any of the sequences. And this line represents the alignment with one untouched sequence of the primer and one uh, the reverse complement of the other uh, sequence. So we're going to always select the line that goes from the uh, lower left to the upper right. So we have to make a double click here. And uh, this is the sequences of, of the, of the, of the, uh, yeah, these are the sequences. We, uh, you, here you just have to put join quit to uh, confirm that you want to make the join and the alignment in this uh, alignment. And you have to avoid all these um, messages. So it asks you, you, do you want to make the join? Yes, I want to make the join. And it gives me this warning and I, don't want to cancel the join, so I put here no. And here I can have the, the alignment that I select, that I wanted to make. So here I put right click, edit contic, and here it appears the sequences of the uh, reverse uh, primer and the sequencing of the forward primer. Uh, to see the electroferogram, I have to double click in the consensus sequences. And here I can see all the electroferogram of both sequences. If I uh, put the arrows, the keys to the to the right, you can see that it navigates. But in order to uh, um, be able to uh, align the the to, to be able to sequence the the um, to clean this sequence, we have to uh, have a perfect or a better alignment so that we can make the double checking better. So for that, we have to see what are the differences between the forward, the reverse uh, sequencing and the forward sequencing. So for that, we're going to settings, highlight disagreements with, I like background color, but you can select foreground color if you want. 
So in blue, there are all the sequences that are unmatching from each other. So here it is a C and uh, the reverse sequencing says it is a C, but the forward sequencing it says it that is a T. So there is a disagreement. That's why it highlights the C. Why? Because if you click here where it says show confidence, you can see the confidence of each base calling. And um, you can see that here, the base calling of the C has a lower quality score. And that's why the software highlights you the C. If we go to other part of the sequence that has, um, mm, 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 mm. wait, yeah, okay. So here you have the other, um, uh, the other example. So here uh, in the forward primer, the 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 quality is worse, so that's why it highlights the T. But as, but as I've told you, we made a very flexible alignment that is not quite correct. So we have to do now a, a, a manual alignment and we have to modify the sequences. So here we're going to go to edit modules and we have to activate all the edit modules that we have available so that we can uh, modify with no restraints. So we are going to um, put here, all the modules of editing. And we are going to look for a sequence that should be in the middle of the reverse and the forward sequencing. So um, what is the, why is this? Because if, you, if we go to the far left of the sequences, we can see that the forward uh, primer sequencing is not very large in this left part. And if we go to the right, the same happens here. The, the forward primer is longer and the reverse primer is not that very long. So we have to um, make an, uh, uh, an alignment <laughs> um, and look, so, uh, so for that we have to look uh, for, um, for a sequence that should be uh, in the middle of both sequences. So as I already did this uh, out of, uh, in, in the backstage, I already have one sequence that I encountered that should be in the middle. This is the CCAGTT. So what I have to do, I have to go to um, next search. I have to search for a sequence. The sequence was, sorry, I have a memory, CCAGTT, right? TTT. Okay. So this is the sequence that I want to look. Um, I choose that from, uh, because I look for in the sequence in the backstage, um, but you should uh, do, you can do this with any sequence you, you want. Um, then you have to look for, um, sorry. Then you have to go here, sorry. Yeah, you have to, yeah, uh, look in the sequence and make the search. So here it is the first um, finding that the software made that is CCAGTTT. And if I search again, which is in the 850 uh, position, if I search again, it finds the other one CCAGTTT in the 880 position. So we can see that they are mismatched in 30 base pairs. Um, you have, you have, you will, what we're going to do is that we are going to add, um, 30 more, um, spaces here so that they are completely aligned and we can double check very, uh, better. So what I'm going to uh, do is that I'm going to go to the, uh, very far left part. I'm going to go where the sequence has the, uh, starts to have, a, a very bad, uh, quality that might be here. And here I have to put insert and I can put with all the uh, edit modules active, I can put 30 of these um, uh, hyphens, I think they are. And I have to put, sorry, I didn't count it, uh, 30, 30 of them because it was almost, um, so here we have two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so here 
I might have um, completely uh, aligned the sequence. So I want to make the search. Um, so here you can see that I missed one, two. So, so for this C to be aligned with this C, I have to add one, two, three, four, three, three or two more of the, those um, icons. So one, two. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so we can see here that um, as we align the sequence with those hyphens, all the blue colors disappear because they are matching each other and we can double check here. Um, so we can now start uh, cleaning the sequence. So what I am going to do is that I'm going to go to the um, far left of the sequence, I'm going to go like right here. And I'm going to start to look at this, at this sequence because as I've told you, um, this is very important to know that if you don't have any information for the other primer, you cannot double check. So you have to check very uh, carefully this only information that you have. So uh, for example, here, I think that, um, yeah. So here, I think that this C is the one, the last one. This is a, um, a total arbitrary decision. I want to take this just from here, the sequence. So from this A to the left, I am not going to take into account, but I can now uh, check from this C. So here I can see the peaks and the quality of the, of the base calling to see if there is any problem. Um, you have to, uh, if we were not in the workshop, we will, I would be uh, making this very carefully, but um, you can see here that the peaks, the, the, the signal peaks are very clear and you can check if there is any problem here. Um, I know that the first problem here starts with in the uh, 310, I think. Yeah. So um, we have to, sorry. Yeah. We have to um, view manually a base per base all if, if there is, if everything is okay. So here we encounter the first uh, base calling failure. So here, for example, as I told you in the in the slides, the base calling algorithm um, says that there are uh, four, five Cs, but we can only see four peaks of Cs. So here you can see that there is just four peaks of cytosine, but the base calling algorithm. If we're not sure, here we have these arrows, this X and Y uh, thing that we can uh, alter so that we can stretch the electrophorogram and see clearer. And here you can see that there is no peak to uh, back the base calling of this C. So we have to eliminate that C from the sequence. So for example, we have to go here and the, in the reverse sequence where this C was um, called and we have to delete it just with a backspace uh, key, you, you just delete it. When you delete it, the, the, um, the consensus sequence also um, has, uh, makes that change. So you have this C, this other C, this C and this C and it, um, forgets about this CL, but you can see it, the consensus sequence doesn't take into account. So uh, here you have another of these problems. Um, you can also delete it because this one of these T's is not um, very good, <laughs> is, is, is not real. And here you have to look at it. Here you have another problem. Uh, you, you have one G, another G, but you have just one peak of G. So you have to go here and eliminate one of these Gs. And basically you have to do this along the sequence. At least you have to be this careful um, until you encounter that you have enough information to make the double checking. So here I might have 
uh, jump some errors here, but I want to show you how this should be done. So here, for example, I can see that this uh, the forward sequence the forward sequence is a little bit displaced to the left. I have to align it again, as the quality of the uh, forward sequence is very bad. I don't uh, mind to put uh, any of um, I I don't mind to modify it. So for example, here I can see that. Um, let me see how can I. Um, yeah, look, for I have a quick question actually. How do you make a decision about what's worth editing and what isn't? Um, sorry, so just. Uh, sorry, yeah. Okay, so, so uh, what what was the question again? Sorry. Um, so when you, I, I did this a while ago. Context. Um, when you're working through your sequence, how did you decide whether it's something worth editing or whether it's just too bad and the sequence's quality is too low to, to put the time into? Okay, so so the quality score, how uh, well? So basically what I, uh, my criteria is how clear the peak is. Uh, if, if, there, if there is a lot of noise and I cannot see a clear peak and the quality is very bad, uh, I, uh, tend to uh, make a decision so that I minimize the, the risk of getting a base that it's not real. So yeah, I think that in, in, in terms of, of quality scores, I look for a minimum of 30, I think it's 39. Minimum of 39 and a very clear peak. Um, so that is how I like, um, that is my criteria. So. Here, as you can see, um, I just have to rely in this sequence in the of the reverse uh, sequence uh, of the reverse sequencing, and um, as I put this this single uh, icon here, I can double check now because here I can see that there in the forward sequence there might be some information that allows me to double check. So here it is this the example that I showed you later uh, in the in the in the slides so here it is a peak of c that the base calling algorithm didn't uh, note it but here it is the c that we have to take into account uh, it read a peak of a i don't know why but here is a clear peak of blue so you have to double check here and continue to make that double checking until you find here where where you have some sort of double uh, back, uh, back to make the double checking, you have to be um, less careful, but still you have to pay attention to what you're doing. So for example, here you have two clear peaks of T and the other sequence, uh, the base calling algorithm called um, three. So to fix that, you should uh, erase one of that. Um, so yeah, basically this is how it is done and you have to do this uh, manually uh, the thing the good thing about this is that is that is a free software and it allows you to uh, modify the sequence uh, most of the softwares that do this job um, uh, are paid require payment and this can do the job it might be take some time but it can make the job and you can save some money to synthesize new uh, genes or some sort uh, or order new primers, etc. So um, what I wanted to do is I want to see in the chat if anyone um, is doing this along with me or if, if you are doing this along with me, you can put one in the chat so I can see if you are doing this with me so that I can um, ask you something. Um, Anybody downloaded the package and is working along with Eric? So if this is not the case, there's no problem. So if, if no one's doing this, there's no problem. Um, you can do this at home. I know these, the steps might be, um, might be confusing, but here you can see how you can double check and with the electroferogram and the quality scores, you can clean your sequences. And once you have the sequence uh, right, 
you should uh, you can go to the sorry what there's you know, one you, 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 you can one go question to on the, quality scores okay yeah um are quality scores red scores or what are they so in my knowledge i think that quality scores are based on how high the signal peaks are and how um how much noise there is in the in in the uh, but in the background of the of the peak so for example here you have a very low um quality scores because the signal it has a lot of noise of g's and a little bit of noise of t so the so the base calling algorithm cannot tell you with a lot of certainty if this is a real t or not so i think that is um what constitutes the quality score but i am not very sure on uh if i am totally right anyone yeah. else can i help answer that question Okay, so um, when you are done cleaning your sequence, what you have to do is um, you can select here and you uh, select the consensus sequence. You copy the sequence that you are sure that you have cleaned uh, well the sequence and you can copy it and paste it in any text uh, um, software, for example, Notepad. Open. Um, and here you can make alignments with this. Another way that you can be, uh, you can check if your cleaning was good is that you run it through NCBI. And if it is very rare to find a new, a new strain, uh, <laughs> if you are using like uh, laboratory strains in your lab or um, you can double check if there is a point mutation. You, once you see that NCBI tells you that um, there is not 100% of identity match, you can, do, uh, you can check uh, that nucleotide and see if that was a right call or you missed that, um, you, you missed that during the sequencing. So just uh, to end this, um, I did this as I told you in my, in my own. So this is a 16S, um, the, the, the folder, the, the IB1 fi files that we used here is from the sequencing of the, um, of the 16S of a strain that we were not sure, sure what was it in the lab. So we uh, sequenced it. And as you can see, it's Staphylococcus hemolyticus. The percentage uh, identity was 100%. And uh, with this, you can like uh, check again if you made the right decisions to um, to make the cleaning of the of the raw sequence. So here is how it should be seen. It, as I've told you, it is very rare, rare that your strain has you encounter new strains in your already lab strain, and you can double check if you. Uh, see here a SNP or uh, yeah, a SNP you can check in the AB files if you made the right call or uh, something like that. So um, I wanted to thank you for the attending of this workshop. I hope it was uh, really helpful because I've seen a lot of um, graduate students that needed to clean their sequence, but they didn't want to pay some of the uh, prices of some softwares that need to be paid in order to make this. Um, I have one question, Eric, um, on the, if you don't mind, for, for, oh. for Claudia as well, about the type of files that Sanger produces. Is it always a AB1 file or can you get a fast Q file as well than the chat? I think in, in my experience, uh, I've always received an AB1 file, but I, I don't know which what, what format is FASTQ. Um, I've heard of it in uh, nanopore sequencing, but I've never heard of it in Sanger sequencing. Um, yeah, but I, I, I don't know if you can get 
and fast queue file format. I don't know, but you can work with AP1 files <laughs> with this software. Thank yeah. you. So if there's any questions, you can ask me. Um, if something was not clear, you can reach us in the Slack also. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's it. You, we have also all the resources where we got the information. Um, you can also see in the, in the website of the package, you can uh, check all the other features of the uh, vector clip and to, to identify a, a vector and that sort of other features that studying has. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks for attending. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Nick. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> and um, well, at this moment, uh, here, here and now, we have a simplified integration of uh, those very expensive machinery that include incubators, growth temperature, and the control rooms that normally you find in bioreactors that cost several thousands of dollars. Um, the idea is that you have an in-situ production of molecular reagent, tissues, and biomaterial, wherever you are or in a um, low-cost environment. And this could overcome many geographical barriers and limited of expensive supply chains that most of the time in, in the lab would be suffered. Um, so the, cap the capabilities of this device are for producing tissue cultures, producing enzymes for modification, could be uh, restriction enzymes, vector plasma nucleic acids, and, and many more. So what are the achievements at this point? The achievements are that we have um, so far um, created a new board. This is the new board that we'll be incorporating uh, into the, in another system. This is the model board that will be, uh, this is controlled by an HPS32 model. And what is it's gonna be incorporating is those devices or those sensors that are required for the purification process, for the downstream process. So it would incorporate a UVD light, the sensors uh, for a UV photometer or a, pistol, uh, or, or a um, uh, um, UVB uh, photometer as well, and hydrostatic pressure sensor for controlling the pressure that is input into the, into the chromatographic media. And there will be future um, uh, features like, for example, um, and option recognition camera for doing several other things. Uh, it's also included a 16 servo control board for valves that could be uh, incorporated for mixing and making gradient, incorporate a gradient generator. Many of the processes required for protein purification or even other type of uh, material, like for example, um, plant extra that are intended to become uh, potential medicines or antibiotics or whatever, they require that they need some time the gradient that uh, is, is uh, input into, into the purification process. Uh, it will, of course, incorporate other flow path valve for selecting uh, which of the buffers are input into the, into the process. I will go in the breakdown with all of that, of course. I mean, I'm just explaining uh, what are the capabilities of the new board. And it has four NEMA drivers. And these NEMA drivers are capable of um, actuating uh, or uh, controlling what is now a fraction collector which is a liquid handling pipetter, which can use any type of pipetter, not just um, restricted one type of pipette. Uh, it also is capable of self-intuitious 3D printing capabilities in the future and plate holder and picking, for example, picking colony. Uh, this is composed essentially by a robotic arm that is controlled by the typical egg white seed um, uh, axis. And we have another um, NEMA that is controlling a variable volume syringe pump that is the one that we incorporating uh, the buffers required for all the processes, uh, but for washing and for um, um, eluting the proteins or washing the cells or washing the material. This also can be used as an extruder for other type of materials that will allow the, the system to, to become a 3D printer for tissues and many other things. So why we decided to, de to develop this machine? So the anatomy of purification system in, the com in, in a commercial solution is usually very, very, very expensive machinery. It's co it can go around $20,000 more. It requires a very uh, expensive um, um, uh, 
uh, habilitation. It requires a lot of training. Uh, and and it is made of several, 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 several subsystems. We tried to simplify that in something that it will be connecting both our bioreactor and also uh, the protopressor that is essentially a chromatographic system. We call that a protopressor because the idea is to make it as simple as making a, a, an espresso coffee, right? So the idea is that this machine will be around less than $100,000 or even less. Um, uh, it's, at this moment, this is the prototype that we have, and I'm going to show you a few minutes later. And the protopressor features, uh, it's a little bit of a Frankenstein in progress. Um, the idea is that it should become scalable. It had a position selector valve, it's a 15 position, two solvent mixer, a sample input made of a disposable IV, um, um, IV valve, like for example, this valve that you will encounter for when somebody is using uh, these uh, uh, medicine in, into, into the blood trims. The idea is to, to incorporate a heavy duty fraction collector that is adapted from microplate to any other large tube. Like for example, you could be incorporating, collecting your propane using these plates, or if you want, or if you need, you can also incorporate these other um, vacuum tubes um, array. So you can, uh, depending on, on your, run and you'll be able to collect the large fraction amount. So it will be enhanced into liquid handling robot pipetting that we already have uh, developed and also a culture 3D printer um, that the idea is that it could fit most commercial pipettes. You don't need actually to buy a special pipette for um, for incorporating into your lab processes. You don't have to spend more money on it. Um, so you don't need expensive adapters. Um, and also we will incorporate a visual art uh, infrared camera that will be able to guide the seed axis for repetitive delicate precision for handling seed or culture, uh, small object manipulation, etc. It will become um, a part of the system that will have a UV spectrometric sound detector that is, uh, um, I'm going to talk about that one. Um, it's at this moment, what we have now is, is just a cell flow that will incorporate a UV LED with a with sensor that we're still working on it. But uh, it's essentially like laser, laser cut um, acrylics like this. And then you sandwich them and put it into a kind of a microfluidic uh, system. Well, this is a more a microfluidic system, but anyway. Uh, the syringe extruder and mixer grading generator is a multiple adapter that it will be able to reuse glass or disposable plastic syringe that will be incorporated with a pressure sensor for the feedback to the chromatographic column. The chromatographic column or the stationary phase, I'm going to uh, break down a little bit more later, uh, is the one that actually does all the job. It's the one that does the filtration depending on the chemistry of the protein or the egg component that you want to purify. So if you want to um, use it in a sustainable way in which you can incorporate several types of, of, of um, stationary faces and different types of buffers. So the idea is that you can uh, use a, a large syringe um, a pump, uh, which you can in, in, in interchange um, all the buffers that you need. At this, it will be incorporated, all this uh, feature will be incorporated in a friendly graphical interface that it will try to become a touch screen or an app like the one we have for the, for the bioreactor. Uh, so this is the phase two where I'm going to show a little bit of how is the bioreactor so far um, working in the lab. So we have already achieved like producing a large batch of proteins, pro sorry, excuse me, and producing red fluorescing proteins and other proteins like, for example, uh, PFU um, polymerases, DNA polymerases, and other RT polymerases. That's in collaboration with another member of, of, of this team, um, Anna Klinov from... from um, People joking. And the proto pressure fraction collector, which is the, at this moment is the one that we have developed so far. Uh, I still like many features that I need to, that they need to be uh, incorporated, like the one, for example, selecting the volumes and uh, adjusting different types of pipette. Uh, it, well, so far, we, we more or less quickly can demonstrate that it's capable of um, volume dispensing in different types of vessels, including these uh, microplate vessels. And well, we still are working on that. Uh, we wanted actually to have this slide, but you know, more philo sometimes is not helping you. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to apologize for that. So uh, this is one of the first things that we so far have purified using the, uh, our system. I want to clarify here that even using uh, this typical commercially solution that is the classical NTA purification, that is unfortunately one of the most expensive, 
Uh, we were capable of purifying the PFU, which was one of the DNA polymerases also used for the detection of COVID. This is more or less the idea behind the, the, uh, the bioreactor. This was used uh, uh, using a, a light induced uh, um, a light induced vector. The idea is also to lower and cut the cost for eliminating the need of other chemicals. So this is uh, a little bit of what is um, um, the future features of proto pressure. I'm sorry, it is, uh, we were gonna try to incorporate a, a, a system, a repository that will incorporate several types of protocol for diversity of purification techniques. Uh, in the further discussion, I'm going to explain why we're gonna do that. Why do you need different types of protocols and why actually you need um, uh, uh, chromatography when there's a system in which you just say, oh, hey, I just boil my protein and my, my, uh, myself and I can get my, my protein. Well, no proteins are made equal and not all your materials are necessarily have to be purified in that uh, affordable manner. So uh, the other idea is to have a dedicated PCB that doesn't require further um, electronic, that is all integrated in one open source motherboard that we have already completed. And in the future, it will incorporate proteomics and genomics, like for example, a heat a shaker, fraction collector for refolding experiment, for example, or pretty head for nucleotides and protein in microarrays. So that's something that we are expecting to finish around uh, mid or late 2022. And, and the computer assisted object recognition, I already have talked about that. So this is on a running collaboration that we're still working on that. So the main point here is using open plasmids that can be light inducible. In the most important part is that we want to reduce the cost also for purification of the stationary phase by using silica for cellular stacks. So far, we have been working on one uh, vector that would allow us to produce proteins that are attacked no longer with a heat stack that you require for purifying a uh, nickel uh, column. But instead of that, another protein that is called CAR9 that is, is, is bind to a silica. And it will come in two uh, flavors, this system, this big system, the one that I just presented, uh, the protopressor Titan, which I named it that way because it's too big. And in the future, probably we're gonna, have present, we're gonna be presenting the Pico version, a portable version that will be downsized everything into single um, suit like this. Uh, the idea is that the light inducible open plasmid will be interchangeable with different tax and promoters that you can test depending on your uh, needs, which are um, which would be the best strategy for, for purifying for purifying your protein. So the idea of these two projects is having them working together in a synergy, both body reactor and the protopressor or the chromatography system. The long-term application of bio processing automation would be endless, right? Even from automated pro phenotyping to organoids and several other things. So the bioreactor is a facilitator and automatic chromatography the protopressor is an accelerator. So we had identified those capabilities. So in summary, we, we already have the new strains controlled by optogenetic switch, which are capable of synthesizing SARS-CoV-2 detection reagent, two DNA polymerases, one reverse transcriptase, several versions of the rocker, one 3D printed and one laser cut, and one with the CNC prototype that are capable of um, um, having one liter media of the batch. This is the size of the, of the, of the, of the production that, that so far we, you are capable to, 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 to do at this moment. Uh, we have the, well, we're working on, 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 um, on uh, creating a PCB capable of integrating multiple sensors that, yes, incorporate the heating, the rocking, the pumps, um, the LED. Uh, we actually use an LED array for inducing the production of the, of the protein uh, by turning off the light. And we have a basic uh, software that has been um, upgraded. Uh, uh, Sasha is going to talk about that uh, uh, with more detail. And I will be controlling all the operations and functions for adjusting the multiple variables. And well, it will incorporate temperature control uni, the pH and so on and so forth. Uh, what is in progress at this moment, we have an OD um, uh, optical density flow cell that uh, um, will be uh, helping, for, helping us for measuring the growth of, this, of the cells or the batches, the calibration for some of the sensors and finalize all the suboptional uh, project like we would like to incorporate them in the future of the solvent oxygen monitoring system also for those that require to be grown in a fed batch uh, regime and also the optimization of the mechanics and the heat vent of that. So uh, um, I'm going to do a quick demo uh, uh, of explaining how to load the, the media into the back. 
Uh, but before that, I'd like to quickly, 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 quickly review some aspects of what is what you might need actually chromatography. We call it recombinant protein for dummies, which actually is a bit, very bad name, but it would say more like a chromatography by processing course in less than an hour, which of course is impossible because bioprocessing is more or less two years or three years at a PhD or a master's degree. But anyway, we try to sum up most of the basic concept that will be required for you to know whenever you are uh, handling these machines. So the general purification process, the bioprocessing uh, uh, thing, is separated into uh, uh, main uh, processes, to call it again. So uh, one of the preparatory steps that we already call it the upstream, as incorporating all the molecular and biology techniques that you require, like MOCLO, uh, interchangeable tags, for some proteins, like uh, reporters, and so on and so forth. I guess there are many people actually in, in the, in the Biosummit talking about that. And let's say the bio, the, the bio reactor covers that part, and the protopressure, the coverage chromatography part, is interested in downstream, like, which are the uh, stationary phases that you're going to use? Like, for example, instead of nickel NTA, maybe you want to use sephiros, or gel filtration, or silica, or anything else. The idea is that both systems will be combined to create something that we call it easy, affordable automation. Means that you don't have to be involved in coding, no messy cloning, no messy clumsy purification, no carpal tunnel syndrome, you want to pipe it a lot. So, yeah, that's the idea. But what is the need that we are covering? Why do you need automated chromatography? You have too many variables. And all those variables that could be, if something could go wrong, like growth cycle, antibiotic selections, a huge list of those, we will try to make it as more simple and seamlessly integrated with these two devices. So the upstream system, whatever, whenever you need to choose which is the system that you want to develop, for, for your protein to be purified, you first need to have a reliable expression system. In this case, we decided to choose our uh, light inducer system because we have already tested many times. And it's a reliable system that we have tested many times, is uh, always growing the same manner, and we decided to use the system for subcloning the protein that we require. But when you are talking about how you're gonna escalate your cells, and this is all part of planning the upscale, what kind of cells do you need to grow? You know, you need to know your batches. And by batches, I'm going to define them like a kind of vicinity of cell, like a kind of a neighbor of grow vessel. The grow vessel is your bag, your uh, flask, or anything where your cells are going to grow. In this case, bacteria. Uh, let's, let's say that in the very rich media, like LB media, this could be like a party for them. But what are the variables? Which are the variables that are critical to define the performance of a batch? One is the living cell concentration or growth which is kind of a demographic of your, or your uh, culture. The other one is the salt gases, like those that require uh, oxygen, or maybe if you're growing algae, they require carbon, ox uh, carbon uh, CO2. And the carbon sources, like what are you gonna feed all to your, your, um, your box, right? How are gonna be the, the, the resources available? But these are interdependent correlation of these three variables. So bioreactor is more like, like playing in the chemical same city. So the upstream and how do you farm your cells can be divided in more, more or less in two um, um, main categories. One is the fat batch and the other one is the continuous batch. I I'm going to go like, and our bioreactor actually is capable of doing both. Uh, a fat batch is essentially the sequential addition of nutrient or an any other carbon source. Like for example, there are sometimes media that are required for uh, catabolic repression. It means that your plasmid or your strain will require to be fed with a particular carbon source in order to start producing the subproduct that you require, right? So in the idea with the, with the bioreactor is that with the pump that it has, you can control that. You can incorporate and recirculate the, 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 the media to bring fresh media into the batch or even extract uh, um, cells from it and actually do a continuous harvesting. Um, here uh, you have the, uh, the continued batch system, which I already uh, um, um, mentioned a little bit that it's recirculating that, but also recovering of them a little bit of the, of the, of the, of the cell that you're taking. Okay, so here's gonna be the, the demo. But before that, uh, I'm gonna explain like the anatomy of our vessel so far. This is a vessel that uh, Adrian ingeniously made it's a great device that incorporates uh, affordable materials. 
essentially a, a bag that you can actually uh, make by your own using a microwavable plastic for uh, also for uh, a freezing your, your food in, in, the, in your kitchen. So you seal the bags and then you add the port. It's essentially incorporate two ports, one input port and output port for the plastic pump. It have one temperature probe and it has an air diffuser for the air to start circulating and one air exhaust filter. So with that, I'm going to start doing this quick, 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 very quick demo, because unfortunately uh, we, we intended to do that in the, in the lab, but unfortunately the lab uh, where I have the, the majority of the reagents and everything, uh, we're playing uh, badly at the uh, connection yesterday that we uh, decided to run a quick, quick, quick um, demonstration. So I have the back here. It's essentially the same rack that you saw, right, with all the ports. And what I'm going to do is connect it to the port of, um, of our peritastic pump so it can start uh, pumping uh, into uh, this colored water because it's not going to be... Um, um, David, can, is there any way you can move your camera so we can see what you're doing? Oh, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm going to actually move my camera. In oh, good one. Thank place. you. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's too so, exciting not to see. Yes, this is this is the bioreactor. This is the same prototype that you saw in the presentation. So I'm going to put my bag um, here. Sorry to interrupt. It also might help if you stop sharing the screen right now. So then um, oh, we can um, see better. Is that okay? Can can maybe one of the organizers um, swap that round, or does David have to do it? Uh, okay. Okay. I think you may have turned your camera off, David, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, just one second. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Perfect. that's good. That's good. Go ahead, David. Yeah, yeah you can yeah. turn it. Can, can you see me? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. everything is good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, Okay, so here's the back, okay, and I'm going to place first the temperature probe in this port, so we'll have a bar that is already inside it, okay, and um, here is one of the input pumps, I'm, I'm going to place it into this peristaltic pump here, okay. I'm going to place it here. So now it's connected. And this is um, the air exhaust with had a filter. And this is um, connected to the air pump, which is located in this part. As you can see, the system is very compact. It's actually more or less the same size of a, a laptop, right? So it's extremely portable. So I'm going to put it in here. So this is two uh, port one for um, the one that, 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 that delivered the air and the one that the suction air. And the last one is going to be directly into my, um, into my uh, water that it's going to be pumping in. So I'm going to show you then now the, um, the graphic interface that Sasha um, did, he did an amazing job. Um, creating an app that is easy to follow for people that we are not uh, <laughs> engineers. So this is more or less uh, how it looks. I'm gonna show you. Uh, it's connected with a Wi-Fi connection. It had it enabled the Wi-Fi that is in, in, the, in the board. Inside you will find a board similarly like this. Uh, Aiden will later explain a little bit more of the, of the board, but this is, this is the board. It's exactly the same that is uh, incorporated into the machine and that um, incorporate um, all the uh, actuators and pumps and so far. So if you go to um, a browser, you will be able to find, uh, well, I guess Sasha will be able to show us a little bit more of that because I cannot um, show it clearly with this illumination, but you have all the main program and the setting. The setting is that you will be able to enable the motor. So let me see if I can connect it. 
Mm. One second. Okay, if you go to program, I'm going to start. Okay. And since you will see that that is now working, right? Okay. And if I go back to my main uh, menu, I also have the logs for pH and temperature. Oh, I'm, I'm really sorry that it's not, not so clear. And uh, Sasha is going to show you later a little bit more of, the, of that uh, with the new version of the program. And then now I'm going to enable the one that is going to be incorporating, well, my fake media, the, the blue uh, solution into the back. So I already have connected one port to the peristaltic pump and the other one that should, oh gosh, this is, and the other one that should be in here. Okay. Ah, I'm taking a little bit the, the hoses. It wouldn't be a live demo if, if, if it, it was perfect. This is very exciting, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so now I connect my blue water and I'm going to connect this one. Actually, just the other folks who aren't um, David, could, would you be able to share the project um, GitLab or website link in the chat? Not you, David. You're busy, but maybe Adrian or one of the other folks. Uh, okay, can can you can you clarify which which website? The, the one that David is is working the the interface right now from. It's it's on his uh, in, um, local network. Okay, so. Um, you can put it to be accessible over the internet, but that you have to uh, to change your your firewall work uh, settings. If you are talking about the website for the project or the project, yeah. project I website, yeah. please. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Back to you, David. Okay, here it goes, and I don't know if you can see how it's pumping. Oh, okay, one second. How it's pumping, and then it's delivering to the back. Okay. So we also are capable of controlling the temperature and also uh, adding some logs. Like for example, if you want to uh, test a different type of strain, you can check the temperature, you can check the rocking speed while we're still working on that. But, um, and also here, let me turn off, uh, let me see, this is one. This is the air pump that, well, unfortunately, I, I guess it will move it you're not going to be able to see it, but it's the one that is injecting the air into the media. And for example, if you are um, growing, um, if you are growing algae, uh, that's very, very, very fantastic. You can connect it to a um, CO2 tank and it can be feeding your algae nicely. I believe so normally we do, we do that. We, we, the central part of, of, uh, of the lab is working with algae. Uh, but well, as you can see now the, the back is being, um, um, fed with the, with the blue solution, right? Now it's increasing the volume. So the, the top volume for this is about one liter more or less. Uh, but uh, the, I think the, the payload is up to two kilograms, right, Adrian? I think it's, it's the maximum weight that is capable of, of, of uh, standing, right? Uh, yes, yes. So at this point, probably around yeah, I don't know, maybe one, one, two kilograms. It depends on the size of the bag and how much liquid moves to, to the edge of it. Uh, we also have a, a I'm, I'm, I'm working on something that will, will have a, a larger, actually not a larger, but a more powerful motor that could probably do uh, at least 30 to 50% more than that. Okay. Oh God, I have a liquid. Um, so I'm going to touch talk at this moment. I'm sorry. Um, Otherwise, it's going to be covered all with blue. <laughs> and let me stop the program. Stop. Okay. So I hope you um, you could you could see how, how more or less our little animal is behaving. Um, 
but uh, essentially that that is. So let me go back to the presentation. Uh, if you have any doubts so far, so you can you can ask me. And um, so David, uh, um, Roman just had a question. Roman, I'm not sure I understand your question. It looks like your pub is single sided. Yeah, yeah, that was my question. Thank you, Alicia. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I just saw your PCB uh, from your documentation site, and uh, I was wondering if it was only one side or a two sided uh, circuit. I'd like to see it's only one. I I'm I'm asking because it might be easier to do if it's a single sided one. Uh, no, no, it's uh, unfortunate. Right, right now it's uh, I think it's like four layers. Um, I so uh, what we can probably do we, we kind of talked about it. We can probably upload the uh, the the set exactly the uh, the zip file that we we send to the man PCB manufacturer for anybody that wants to to get it. It's a after being manufactured, it comes down to about five dollars per 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 board. Uh, that without the uh, you know transportation uh, costs and stuff like that. Thank you. Okay. Um, oh, Adrian, if you, would you like to go further with the explanation of the component, or should I jump into the uh, into the part of the downstream processing? Uh, okay. Well, I, I, I can I can give you a little bit of a. Uh, you know, maybe a slight more information there. So, okay. so most of the components were bought from uh, Ali, uh, AliExpress or Alibaba, which, which means that, you know, the quality is not necessarily very high, but the price is very, very low, uh, which brings, which will bring the total for the bioreactor in components, probably somewhere around $400, given taking, uh, depending how you, how you do it. Um, so uh, the, the, uh, the board itself, can do more motors that we can do right now. So we have a, the main one, the rocker motor, which is with the uh, NEMA 17, which is like a, a stepper motor, which is slightly more expensive, about $15. But we have, uh, we can mount on the box and the, the, the piece, the, uh, the circuit, the electronics can probably uh, easily accommodate about four or five motors. Right now we use only one for the air pump and uh, one for the circulation pump. I mean, yeah, we, we, that's what we normally use there. Um, but the, uh, yeah, so the, the board, it, the, um, the box itself, you can mount more, more uh, like uh, circulation pumps or more, uh, you know, um, uh, other types of, uh, of, of devices there. So that's one thing. The other one that I think I mentioned a little bit. So, so yeah, the, uh, we didn't put any electronics like uh, displays and other controls on the board to, to keep it to keep the cost down. So everything is done from the from the software from the software interface. We use a fairly cheap controller, slightly more expensive than Arduino, which is ESP32, which is uh, uh, gives you the Wi-Fi capabilities. And yes, if you you can share the, the link. Uh, you know, on a, on an external website, like David could do that if you were to uh, want to, uh, you know, put some rules in the uh, in his router. So, in principle, you can monitor it from another country if you if you wanted to do that. Um, we have uh, so the uh, the silicone bag. It's fairly cheap. It's about five, you know, uh, sorry, uh, about ten to fifteen dollars. Uh, probably even cheaper if you buy a smaller quantity. We also have a another version that an experiment, which is this. It's a it's a silicon box used for casting. Uh, I don't know your uh, uh, candles and stuff like that. It's about ten centimeters in uh, so about four inches uh, in, in size there. And we tried actually Alex tried and we we did a. a, a a custom silicone pore in there, where you can put your uh, uh, your uh, probes and and uh, all the other stuff in there. So uh, so yeah, that's uh, that that's another possibility. And uh, what else? Oh yes, sure. So one of the things that was listed in there as a as a work in progress was the uh, OD uh, monitoring. So the optical density monitoring. That's important to know exactly how well to kind of. It's not going to be able to know, but it, it, it's it's good to kind of try to figure out how much, what part of the life cycle the bacteria is and when to trigger the induction, which means turning on the light to tell the bacteria 
uh, in this case, start producing the protein there. So I, and this was actually, we figured out uh, fairly uh, uh, recently. There's none, uh, so for, for that you need a flow cell. So basically, um, um, you know, when you take the liquid, the media with the bacteria from the uh, bioreactor, you have to, to, uh, to go to like a, a measuring instrument. So normally it's done with these things called the cuvettes, uh, which are, yeah, that's why I was doing my, uh, my light uh, strobe thing there. Uh, yeah, cuvettes. And these are simple disposable plastic ones, but for us, that would not work. So I managed to find out, and these are fairly cheap, it's about uh, you know under ten dollars, good quality um, quartz cuvette, um, and if you can look at it, I'm not sure. So one side is clear and one side is frosted, which is kind of what it should be. The problem that we had is like in order to make this in a cell flow, you have to either make a hole in the back because you need the tube, you need the, the liquid to go through it, or to cut it, and that was very hard. We I broke uh, you know numerous of this. Uh, and then finally, I found a way to cut them underwater, which takes very little uh, time to, if you know about it. The second challenge was to, to be able to close them. Now, I mean, it's not easy. It's, it's easy to close them, but we wanted to make them autoclavable. Uh, and that means that we are limited to some, only some materials. So polyethylene, uh, I think it's called PE, um, it's, it's autoclavable and also silicone is autoclavable. So, after many trials and tribulations, we, I managed to use some bathroom silicone. And uh, okay, so this is the final result. So as you can see, we basically put two quarks of silicone uh, on the sides there and, uh, and this polyethylene, uh, uh, I think it's called uh, bulkhead. And it, uh, of course it's, uh, it's waterproof. Uh, and it's working very well. And uh, now, once this is done, we had to find a way to to attach a light source and the uh, the sensor on the other side. So, uh, so right now we got this three uh, D printed adapter here, so we can put the and run the, uh, the flow cell through it in the proper way. Okay, well, something like this. And there is a hole in here. Okay, it's probably in the other direction. Um, so I can show you that. that path. Okay, yes. So now you can see the my disco my disco light in here. So basically, right now, uh, these are the electronics. Uh, well, these are the full electronics. So this is the sensor, uh, this board in here, and this is a, a, an orange LED, so around 600 nanometers, that's kind of standard. It doesn't matter so much, but that's, that's the proper standard. And, and this will go nicely on this side in here and the other one. And after that, we have this extra, extra box that comes over it. Okay. And so it comes like a sleeve. And, uh, yeah, actually, we drop it in. Okay, so this is kind of what what the whole thing is, and of course we can attach it. There's a there's a little hole in here. We can we can screw it in on the uh, either the walls of the box or um, maybe to to something else. Anyway, so this is, for instance, the, the material that the box is made of. This is a material, the same thing as the cutting boards, IKEA cutting boards, and it's fairly easy to put together. Actually, it, it holds together by just pushing it uh, one one and the other one. And yeah, there are, this is the central one where we have the, the main motor, the motor that does the rocking, okay? Uh, also, because we did, we worked on, on this uh, um, OD meter, we, I'm gonna reuse this one and also make like a uh, like a, a standalone uh, OD meter. So basically, another piece that's 3D printed. We drop the same part on it with a cuvette, and uh, well, this is gonna have uh, 
the processor in here and it's going to be a uh, uh, of the speak that we, we can also use so uh that's kind of what i wanted to tell you the other thing is like as a project also like the the rocker for the bioreactor can also be used as a as an independent uh, rocker uh, for uh, you know other uh, molecular biology wet lab applications thank you great um, I guess uh, we can switch to Sasha that uh, she can ex he can explain us a little bit more of the of the new feature that uh, the software and the interface incorporate. So there have been many upgrades and uh, well, Michael, with you, Sasha, please. Yeah, I, uh, I wanted to talk not only about what features do we have because there are there are quite quite a lot of them but rather how it can be useful for you guys how you can use it in your lab because Alexander, obviously Sasha, yes. can you please move your microphone closer to your mouth you're a little quiet oh can you hear me now well okay that's better thank you uh, so as i said we our intention uh, was not only to create a device not only for ourselves but also so it would be useful useful for everybody uh, and I'm going to start with, uh, mm -hmm. I guess you can see my screen now. So this is the internals of uh, what David was showing. This is the bioreactor from up above. And there is no lead, but you can see the pumps, peristaltic pump, air pump, the board itself, and a bunch of the sensors. Uh, it's pretty customizable device so uh, right here i don't have ph meter uh, but i can connect as many well up to three temperature sensors for example i can connect uh, several different drivers or so motors uh, here below you can see the nema 17 only also i can connect different heating pads uh, i have two connected uh, over here but on the stand i have on my table i have only one so you can connect uh, to outputs, uh, whatever is useful for you. For example, we have also output for LED uh, to induce protein growth, for example. Uh, I can enlarge the board and here you see a lot of pins. Uh, so bottom ones are designed for, for connecting, how, how can I say, high high power uh, devices like nema 17 or hidden pads and you can I can connect them up to six uh, and the device stepper nema 17 is connected over here so my idea is it's not only how we can connect but also you can connect any device which basically has two wires ground and uh, voltage and it might be very useful for your application as well uh, now, what back to our UI? Actually, I'll hide this thing. This is the main page, and I can say that our device can operate in two modes: free one and the program mode. Uh, when I was talking about different devices connected, uh, I was referring to this page uh, being able to manipulate every output uh, separately. So you see here, I have just hardware names because they actually reflect uh, the board pins. Uh, right now I have hidden pads, hidden pad connected to over, over here. Once I enable it, you, you will be able to see in a moment uh, my temperature sensor fills uh, the hidden. Yeah, it starts growing and you can connect anything to all other outputs. Uh, it's also not just on off, uh, it's uh, controlled through PWM, you can put it 50%, whatever you, you like to, uh, and you can manually run uh, enable motor and, or any other output like LED for inducing the light. But okay, you think, well, it's good that you can do it manually, but we want some automation. So for that, we have a program menu where you can set up different... Uh, sets predefined parameters. Uh, so here I have just, just an, as an example, if I'm gonna produce uh, E. coli bacteria, uh, induce growth of E. coli, I have some setup like temperature, pH, 
in future we will also add OD. So I can start the program. Uh, it will automatically track the motor, will enable automatically the motor, the heating pads. Once I, I've reached designated temperature, uh, the heating pad will shut, uh, shut down. The same with pH. Uh, once we have uh, reached the desired pH, we will turn off the peristaltic pump, which of course uh, should be connected to some volume before in advance. One, we also have uh, different sets of uh, programs, so you can save as many as you want. Uh, on the output, you can see the history of your run, of your, of your batch. So this is just an example that's not an actual run. So you see, I don't have pH sensor connected, but I had uh, temperature in OD. And you can imagine like we had temperature growed and uh, we also observe, should observe that our bacteria start producing itself, start growing and our OD, OD decreases uh, to kind of zero or not, not transparent value. And of course, this is all works through Wi-Fi. Uh, referring to the question about website, this is my local device. It's not accessible to internet because this is just the hardware sitting on my table. That's why only those who in my network can reach this website. Uh, I can see, I can track the values uh, and, and yeah, I can manipulate and stop and, or start a program at any time. Thank you. So now I think, uh, David, uh, you want to add something more or maybe we should open it to the question? Uh, yeah, I think we should go to question and answer because um, uh, I, I actually wanted to share a little bit of the strategies that we are proposing for uh, the protein purification, like which are the... Um, uh, the stationary phases that we are incorporating into future. Like for example, for this quick uh, purification that we did for the um, linear polymerase, we use a commercial um, um, column like this. But these are normally very expensive for the average pocket. So the idea is to use one of these, you know, one of the recyclable glass um, uh, refillable columns in which when we, we finish the, the, the silica system, in which you no longer are gonna depend on expensive column like this, but on a cheap system, you can actually um, uh, reuse. So that, that's our main goal. I guess uh, this is a little, uh, this short time for explaining all the details, but uh, this is more or less the main idea. Um, yeah, that, that will be um, all from my side. Yeah, so I guess if anybody has any questions, uh, we, I mean, we definitely can talk another half an hour easily with the material that we prepare for today, but uh, I think it's, it's a good idea to give people a chance to, to voice their um, questions. You can type I have in. a question, actually. I got a um, question. I have a question. Have you investigated using this for anaerobes, which is often a very challenging and a very expensive type of research to embark upon? I, I think, I think, well, I'll, I'll take this question. I, I think at this point, no, because we are still, uh, you know, enhancing the, uh, uh, the, the device it, it, itself. But uh, the, our plan is to kind of make programs for each of these proteins that we might want to be. Maybe we're going to start with the one that stands for the, the three genes one, that we're going to put them in there. And we'll try with more organisms and maybe make kind of a collection or publish somewhere of, of programs when, when to trigger the inductions and, and, and so on. So certainly there's lots of, uh, lots of applications of the bioreactor. We wanted to do some other things. Maybe I'm, I'm, personally interested in, in, in uh, viral vectors and other things there. But uh, yes, that, that's, uh, you know, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, the, if you build them, maybe people will come and will, will try all kinds of crazy things. I mean, like very, very valuable things. <laughs> Uh, 
if there are no other questions, maybe David can continue a little bit with the, uh, uh, if you want to do the uh, purification part of that. But yeah, we are also looking into cheaper uh, methods of purification, as David was mentioning the silica and some other, some other types. And uh, yeah, so he, he did quite a little bit of research in that respect. Yeah, I, I but, guess okay, I could talk a little bit of that in the last five minutes. Uh, that we, have. we just have, sorry, uh, David, an intervention where you have one question um, from oh, okay, Vlad. Okay. Um, so it's in the chat, but if in your pre purification process, what route have you decided on for cell lysis? Oh, what, sorry, please. Uh, um, what, what's the what, uh, what shall we use for cell lysis? Oh, oh, that's a great question, you know. Um, we have actually uh, went to a buffer that we discovered what the easiest to run. There are several types of lysis, you know, using in a, in a set of lab, like uh, like in a university lab, you use a sonicator uh, or you use other type of, 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 of lysis. Those, of course, are some limiting factors as well. They are very expensive too. So we decided to combine two things. Uh, one is a chemical buffer that I modified the formulation and also uses glad beads. Glad beads are very, very cheap. Actually, you can use glad beads for those for, uh, you know, for decoration or for jewelry, for, uh, nails that nails. worked fantastic i mean you can actually use that and you'd have to spend like a lot of money on that so uh, uh at this moment we are still working on another device that can help us for the harvesting and the lysis but so far at this moment we have um that the glass bead in a regular vortex or by shaking uh, for several uh, minutes uh, with the with the formulation of course we can share all, all that with you guys uh do wonders. Uh, actually, the, the, the magic trick of the buffer is just plain twin 80. It, a twin, uh, um, it's the only thing that you I need to add that is a little bit difficult to find as a reagent. And the, other, the others are just uh, the same buffer, the same uh, um, sulfate or phosphate buffer that you just need to adjust depending on the pH or your protein or whatever. But essentially, those are like two magical steps. The beats, beating, and um, and um, and, and, and the buffer with the with the with the twin eighty. We also looked at uh, some other methods like sonification and, and stuff like that. But uh, at this point, we didn't get so far with that. There, there's electro shocking, and there, there are many other ways. We're still going to look at those. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Adrian, uh, David, and Sasha for uh, such a great workshop. Uh, does anyone has any questions? If not, uh, we are going to take a 15 minutes break. Yep. Yeah, maybe I, I actually have one. Uh, um, do you know someone who's already um, duplicated your, your project? somewhere <laughs> I, I can take that one uh, well uh, no not not at this point but we are we have several several of I mean like okay uh, we did send some of these bioreactors to a couple of more people and uh, hopefully they are, they are gonna use that uh, and uh, yes o o on the other side I can tell you that I, there's no open source wave bioreactor that I'm aware of right now. Uh, and actually we chose the, this is probably another thing that might be important. We chose the wave bioreactor, which is more complicated than just, you know, magnetic bead, uh, magnetic uh, um, uh, or baffle uh, um, orbital yeah, or, or any other method because uh, wave bioreactor can also be used in principle with like mammalian cells or more advanced cells that will break otherwise. So that will give us the possibilities to do lots of lots of other things. Uh, and uh, and yeah, uh, practically a quarter of our uh, our effort went into creating the uh, the rocker mechanism because it's more complicated when you rock everything than uh, than, okay. uh, than when you just have a, a jar with uh, with uh, some magnetic stir in it. 
You, you just mentioned uh, mammalian, uh, mammalian uh, cells. Are, are you inserting CO2 in there? No, not at this point. We have not gone into that, but that, that's one thing that I would be interested in because like, for instance, if you want to do like viral vectors or something like that, you, you would have to, uh, to use a month. And, and there are some other, you know, bio, you know, bio organs and stuff like that, that we, we would have to do that. Now, there's another thing that we forgot to mention. Uh, now, we have a, a, um, an extra, this is going to be an optional, but we have some work, quite a little bit of work of, of uh, oxygen uh, measurement in, in it. Okay. So, uh, uh, but that, that's a little bit that's a little bit difficult. We, we have the sensor, we have the, actually we, we made a, specific, a small PCB for it, but we have not had time to, to, to do that part. And now that, that'll be a little bit uh, oxygen concentration in a liquid, that'll be a useful thing. Actually, and the P, pH probes, we did try them, but not with the, with the bacteria. So the software works with the pH. Uh, you, you even saw the, uh, the pH when Alex showed you. So, uh, so that's another part that we have in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I would, actually have a little more questions, but maybe it's, it's time to stop. <laughs> well, you can send them uh, pri uh, privately or, well, I mean, privately, directly in the chat, in the uh, to Slack. Sure. Okay. I I wanna... No worries. Thanks, Romain. Okay. Great, great questions, everybody. Thank you very, very much for your participation. Thank you. Just... Uh, thank you so much uh, to uh, Adrian and David and Sasha. Uh, we have about 30 minutes of break. Uh, we had uh, another 15 minutes, uh, but since this workshop, uh, it had, uh, it needed to, uh, go, it still have 15 minutes. So, uh, if anyone does not have any questions, then uh, we are going to take a 30 minutes break and, and then come back at uh, 4.45. Well, I, I'm not sure, but David, uh, if you want, you can also uh, maybe like uh, uh, finalize that part with the, uh, uh, with the post-processing there. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, if we, if we have like five minutes yeah. extra, yeah, 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 yeah. Can... no, actually, yeah. we have another yeah. fifteen minutes. I because now I realize it. the workshop was not uh, one hour, but uh, yeah, we still have a, uh, but it's an hour and fifteen minutes, so we do still have fifteen oh, okay. minutes. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. Well, okay. So, well, yeah, yeah, I can find a light uh, other point, which is actually very quick. You know, is is um, is discussing a little bit of the option that you might have whenever you're running your um, uh, the protein pressure. Uh, so I go back to the presentation and uh, well, um, if you decide to choose this light inducible system that we have tested, uh, there are so many options. And I think um, um, an another speaker from last year presented a similar system for, um, you know, like presenting a miniaturized system for, for producing uh, proteins of other um, type of biomolecules using light. But anyway, uh, the general idea is that, um, uh, and, and I, I guess this uh, is going into another direction like, like, like Adrian suggested. Not all proteins are made equal and not all proteins um, require the same thing, you know? Like for example, when you're purifying from mammalian cells or from algae or bacteria, all of them re will require definitely different types of treatment. And, and one of the most important part is at the level of transcription, there is um, a post-translational translational, um, modification. There's a, 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 trick, a critical step for many proteins, essentially those from eukaryon that are re required to become um, decorated with several types of molecules like glycosylations or any other type. So uh, not also the vector, but also um, how the host system will require uh, to incorporate other type of, of, of um, let's call it um, in a colloquial well, ingredient, right? In order to thrive in that uh, little environment. So uh, it, going back to one of the main systems that normally everybody uses is affinity chromatography. And the affinity chromatography is essentially kind of a Velcro system, right? In which your protein is genetically mo modified 
in order to recognize another matrix. And that matrix is chemically compatible to that. And uh, in order to remove all the debris, you wash all uh, the proteins that are bound and those that are not bound. And those that are bound are, are attached to your matrix, attached to your stationary phase. So the binding material then is recovered using a, com a competitive inhibitor that is um, competing with the same space for displacing your protein. So um, it, it, that's sometimes not so easy for certain proteins and it comes the automation in handy at this moment. So the mixers and, um, and the buffer mixer is gonna help us for uh, generating the gradient in order to uh, wash the proteins uh, and you don't have to actually be stick directly to the column uh, watching uh, when is the phosphor that is coming and, and, and so on and so forth. So we would like to incorporate in the future that feature in which uh, mixing a buffer, adding it, pumping into the into the uh, column, washing several times depending on the, on the protein that you require, uh, are going to be a, a key feature for different types of protein. And it will help you to both calculate the uh, buffer condition. Like for example, if you need to increase the pH or you need to uh, lower the salinity or whatever, depending on your, um, on your protein um, biochemical features. So uh, yes, this is more or less the presentation of what we have been working uh, as a side project as well. At this moment, we're working with hashtag with using the um, uh, expensive commercial um, uh, columns, but uh, we have we have been working uh, uh, in the last six months, I would say, um, in another system that will use the same plasmid for um, that could be induced with light, same blue light uh, uh, system, but it will carry another tag that um, we're modifying modify it a little bit because, in my understanding, uh, there's one pattern for that. But the idea is that we can recover using silica. Silica is extremely cheap, actually you can use silica from uh, the warehouse stores. So like for example, if you get one for uh, silica for your plants or for a desiccator, actually you can treat it chemically that it can be used also for purifying DNA. Uh, there I believe is one protocol um, somewhere that I could use silica for, for a, a mini prep preparation. Uh, in the same manner, you, you can use uh, the CAR9 proteins um, that will be tagged to the protein of interest uh, with this system that is explained in this work by the Baniek group in, um, in, um, in Oregon. Um, that is more or less what we are working at so far. So uh, actually I wanted to present just a quick demo, but it's, it's nothing, nothing really that complicated. Uh, the idea is that when you take a syringe like this and you place it directly into your column, right? So it's more or less the way in which you recover um, to recover uh, your protein. But these have to take two, uh, four steps. And those four steps are always repeated. Lysis, load, wash, and elute. So the idea is the proton pressure or the machine in the future in incorporating with the valves and the between uh, uh, valves will be capable of adding the lysis buffer, loading into the sample, the sample into the, into the column, wash it as many times as you require, and then elute it all of that in an automated way. So we want to make protein purification simple. Uh, we understand that um, this is, I believe, one of the very, very far-fetched uh, objectives because uh, as I mentioned, chromatography is one of the most uh, time-consuming and very complex sciences. Uh, and uh, you can actually devote your, your life to chromatography of protein. However, we would like to make it simple and this is more or less the program that the system is going to incorporate. A lease step, a low step, a washing step, and a loose step. And it's gonna be places into the robotic arm so that you can recover your protein depending on the fraction. So at last and not least, I would like to thank most of the people that have been involved in this project. This is an amazing um, uh, team that uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a collaboration that I hope this will last many, many, many more years. And um, from my side, uh, I would like to, to ask these two guys, Daniel Cepeda with the logistics for helping us to bring all the material here to collection. But sometimes it's a little bit difficult with all the um, logistics to bring material back to Mexico. And Julio Sapra, the Universita Estatale de Milano, 
he is one of the collaborators with us that works on the algae and also it's a, it's, it's a fun um, um, colleague that has helped us a lot also with the biochemistry. And well, um, definitely this amazing group that I'm so glad to have been invited last year when Adrian uh, invited, to, invited me to participate into this project, Adrian Phillips, that leads Otago Bioscience, Alexander, Sasha, and a bunch of people that it's, it's, it's not listed here, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an amazing team uh, and other volunteers, of course, uh, Juggle, that have been uh, the main provider for the funding and um, the free genes uh, funding also for sharing the material and uh, Jenny Molloy's lab that have also been a very, very helpful um, um, giving us some feedback on, on, the, on, the, on the development of the project. So thank you very much for this, for this time. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Yeah, and I wanna thank David because uh, yeah, he was very, very instrumental at creating uh, this success for us and uh, just, just in a, as, as, a, as a small detail, for instance, we had problems sending David some of the uh, uh, reagents and some of the organisms because the uh, uh, Mexican uh, border uh, um, uh, agency uh, com confiscated them. Actually, at one point, he was supposed to get some materials from free genes from, uh, um, from Stanford, and again, they, they were uh, they were stopped. So, uh, you know, if you if you are planning to do a community lab and you're gonna be able to have a bioreactor, you might be able to provide yourself with some of the uh, proteins and, and, and enzymes without having to, to depend on, uh, on this uh, uh, external uh, um, sources that might be unre unreliable. And, uh, and uh, in any case, they're gonna be expensive uh, anyway. So, thank you. Um, if it's all right, I was just going to give a brief overview of what we're doing in this workshop. Um, and then I'm going to, we're going to flip our order of, of how we were going to do this a little bit so that I can hand um, over to Nadia, um, who has like a conflicting thing in her busy professorial schedule. Um, so she can kind of talk a little, introduce herself. And, and one of the things that we kind of, um, basically, how I wanted to introduce this workshop is it's kind of pictures design your own community lab. I feel actually like make might be a better phrasing. We're going to be talking a little bit about um, making, um, about how people design the systems and the things that they use to do work in community bio labs, um, and talking a little bit about the research that we've been doing over the last year at the University of Washington, um, working interviewing community bio lab. Um, users and managers on those sorts of topics and then doing hopefully it'll work some kind of fun um, creative design activities with all of uh, all of you um, yeah and I wanted to yeah let's just hand over to Nadia if you wanted to introduce yourself and like a little bit of the context of human computer interactions yeah thank you Orlando um, I'm going to share my screen and Maybe. So, hello everyone. I am Nadia Peak. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Washington. I run a research group called Machine Agency where I get to hang out with people like Orlando and Kelly and many other people. And we're focused on the precision of machines and the creativity and the possibilities that they afford individuals. We mainly do this from human computer interaction, the field. And human computer interaction is not really anymore about how humans interact with computers, but more about the possibilities of technology and the behavior and, and the behavior of humans, be they in groups, um, be it with be it with a screen, be it with um, hands-on with a hands-on interface. Um, and so a lot of what we explore is understanding how we can use automation to, um, to do tasks that otherwise are being explored in, um, that otherwise are being explored perhaps manually or how technology can serve um, to help with that type of task. But there's a bunch of different other kinds of things that are explored in human inter interaction and hum human computer interaction. And it really goes very broad into not just talking about, well, how do we make this feature of this technology more usable, 
but just in general studying how do people interact with technology um can we build new technology that does things in different ways what's possible here what are people doing and like how do we design for that and those possibilities and there's a lot of opportunities i think for systems researchers like myself um to contribute to some of the challenges that are facing um, DIY bio and community bio spaces. Um, here are just some papers that are from the HCI field about that touch on different themes and different challenges within DIY bio. Um, and so within this workshop, I guess one we're focused on community bio labs and the possibilities they're in, but we really want to encourage you all to think from this HCI lens of what is possible for technology? How do we interact with it? And how do we want to shape the future for what we might um, what we might give shape to and how we might interact with those things? Um, so yeah, it was my brief intro, hopefully brief enough, Orlando. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess I'll briefly introduce myself and Kelly. Where'd she go? Oh yeah, <laughs> an opportunity. And then whilst it would be cool to hear from like everybody individually, um, we have a little, a little interactive way for everyone to introduce themselves, which will also introduce those who are not familiar with Google Jamboards to them, which will be hopefully the structure that will work for everything else we're doing in the workshop. Um, so yeah, I just basic, I think the main thing to, to point out about me is that I have a very like dual hats here that I'll be talking about work that I'm doing together with Nadia and Kelly at the University of Washington in Seattle. And I also um, help to run Sound Bio Lab, which is a community lab um, in Seattle. Um, and was kind of, that work was what kind of inspired working together with Nadia and Kelly on this. And so, um, and I would say that like, if you were kind of wanting to hear more about just like how to, all the kind of, broader issues of how to start and run a community bio lab. I am always happy to talk to anybody who is interested in that. Not that I have all the answers, but it's something that I'm definitely um, happy to help with or just share my thoughts. Um, Kelly, I don't know if you want to just, no pressure. If you want... If you give a little emoji. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I think we're good. <laughs> cool. Um, so what I wanted to do, I'm going to share in the chat a link to a Google Jamboard that you should all have at, like editing access to, which can quickly descend into madness, but hopefully will be, um, will keep control. And that should hopefully take you to the first page. And there's essentially the free, they're called frames, the pages of the Jamboard. Um, it's pretty similar to like Miro or other kinds of tools like that. So hopefully by now in like year two of the pandemic, we're probably pretty used to these things. Um, and I thought a fun way to kind of get a better idea of who all is here and particularly like where people are coming from in terms of their um, experiences with or interest in community bio spaces. Um, starting with, I'm going to if I need to, I might kind of screen share if people need help, but um, hopefully you should see a page that says kind of where in the world are you and has a little map of the world and should be on the left hand side of your screen. You have a bunch of different tool options you can select from and the top one is a pen um, and you can kind of pick that and then you can draw where in the world you are approximately. Uh. And please, I think this will be pretty relaxed. So like jump in, um, so either if you don't want to, you can put in the chat or just say, if you're like, what, how do I, how does this work? Cause we're going to do, this is basically going to teach you how to use the various tools that uh, we're going to need a bit more intensely coming up. So we've got some people. Okay. We've got, well, Seattle. Yeah, we need that. Uh, got some Northeast, maybe that's Boston, um, South America, the UK. India, um, someone moved the box that the map was in. This is the big <laughs> floor with Google Jambles. It's very easy to accidentally like select something and then like 
or like if you want you could delete the map they so please don't take that as a challenge um okay cool got a bit of an idea of some of where we're coming from uh, if you still working on that feel free to but you can click onto the next frame so that's like at the top you'll see there's some the sort of rectangular icon with some numbers in it um the first one was one of eight and then two of eight if you click along is to circle the stickies so that's the little yellow boxes that describe you um, and if you don't find that you kind of fit any of those things that have already been predefined you could add your own um if you uh wanted to add your own you just look along to the tools and you'd see that kind of in the middle there's this one called stickies that's how you could add your own sticky note um yeah and so yeah i think i see some people already circling or indicating in some way kind of what matches them it could be multiple of these Orlando, do you want to do a screen share uh, for the people that maybe don't have access to the to the Jamboard? Um, yeah. Do, do, do. Hopefully you can see that. So if you're not uh, on the Jamboard, you can see kind of what's happening. We've actually got like quite a range. It's kind of interesting. Every single one of these different um, stickies has had at least one person um relating to it so we have people who are currently working in on managing community bio labs we also have people who have like no experience but are kind of interested in joining one or want to start one and at least one person who has experience working in a home lab which i feel like is not necessarily like we're going to talk a lot about shared community labs but i want to i think those are also important diy bio spaces that often get a bit forgotten um hopefully you had enough time to do that and yeah move along to the final one for now which is what experience do you have if any with making your own tools so in this one now you have to start branching out into creating adding your own sticky notes so i think hopefully you should be able to see my cursor as well that this is the way you can add your own sticky note uh, it's going to be a lot easier than trying to write in highlighter although if you feel like you have the creative prowess to do that i'm not neat enough um, there is also a text to box tool as well feel free to use whatever comes to you i think hopefully you can see that that's kind of what pops up when you add a sticky note actually what do i want to write should think that Cool, we've got lots of different um, prior experiences, like people who've written protocols for the OpenTrons, um, which is a um, automated liquid handling platform. Um, so we've got some people making DIY incubators, um, some people who've made bioprinter, laminar flow hood, assembled IKEA furniture. Like I think this is um, uh, not necessarily too dissimilar to uh, making the piece of equipment in the lab. Um, so we've got quite a bit of, I mean, I guess no one's indicated necessarily here that they have no experience with making anything. Um, that is also fine. That's definitely the kind of my, until very recently, my background. Um, Cool. Thank you all for that. And I'm going to, well, actually, I think we can probably segue directly into the next exercise, um, which is going to continue on from this um, and start to think about uh, the, um, oh, hopefully.
um, thinking a bit more deeply about some of the considerations that might inform if you kind of imagine that you wanted to design something totally new for a community bio lab. Um, what might be some of the considerations that could go into that before you start actually kind of um, making anything um, and so what I'm going to so you just learn how to use sticky notes so try this again and so I have three questions for you the first one is why do you think it's important that people should be able to access and use community bio labs and if you've never used one yourself that's totally fine like this can be just whatever comes to your mind if you were to guess um, and in case it's not obvious there is not a correct answer to this there's going to be lots of different answers Cool. I'm just gonna like exploring a little bit of the some of the things that are already popping up. Um, we had kind of providing access to tools, information, and expertise, and particularly highlighting equitable access. So there's kind of a, a social justice element potentially um, to democratize science. I think that's something we talk a lot about um, in this community, um, which I think is kind of sort of uh, I think for a lot of people would encompass this idea of equitable access. Um, affordability for SMEs and startups, so kind of encouraging enterprise um, and innovation, um, innovation within kind of biotech startup space, um, using shared tools they might not know how to use. Um, yeah, and like basically harnessing the power of biology to solve problems. Yeah, and engaging more people and being able to solve those problems, I think. Um, yeah, cool. Like, I think that's already like, it might be there's a lot of overlap here, but this is also actually quite a wide breadth of different um, motivations. Um, it's really interesting. Sorry to, and I'm going to have to speed you along. Um, feel free to come back to this. Oh, also, I'm going to share all of this, just this whole jam board, like in the Slack afterwards, if you're interested in kind of coming back to review any of this. Um, so the next frame, if you're ready, is what is a project that you worked on recently in a community bio lab or what would you like to do so moving away from like the kind of motivations to like the actual activities so if you've already been do working in a community bio lab trying to like briefly summarize in a phrase or a few words what you've been doing and if you maybe are someone who's interested in future like do you have an idea of what you might be interested in doing Cool, so we've got some things already um, starting to appear. Um, and I mean, there's already two into that kind of looking at transgenics, gene editing, 
um, studying immune cells, uh, the specificity differentiation. So like uh, we've got some bioplastics and biomaterials, um, microbial finishing for textiles, bio art, um, quite a lot of different activities. I think that it's clear that a lot of these, um, I'm sure everyone, anyone who's already working on any of these projects is probably well aware that this is really demanding complex stuff that's really like these are cutting edge sorts of activities that you might well expect to find happening in um, professional science labs, professional design studios. Um, so this is not really simple stuff. Um, okay. um, finally, feel free if you wanted to add something more there, but the final question before we move on is barriers. So we talked like what kind of motivates us, what are we doing or we want to do, and what is maybe stopping us from being able to achieve the things we want to do. Um, and thinking particularly about that sort of project work in a lab space, because as I know, a lot of things like a community lab might have a lot of ambitions beyond just kind of supporting project work. But if you think about you want to do some kind of project in the lab space, what could be the barriers that would hold that back? And these could be speaking from experience or just your best guesses. Cool. So we've already got some good things coming in. Funding, yes. <laughs> Money is always, and particularly funding for the lab itself. Uh, so I'm not sure if that's necessarily what is, um, uh, if that was intention, but there's kind of the money for the specific things you might need for your project, but also the, the rent and the utilities bills and stuff. So you actually have a space to do that work. Um, having time, if you already have a job, which is probably going to be, you know, having a job, childcare duties, other big demands on your time is probably going to be the reality for a lot of people who are using community lab spaces. Um, space, storage, cross-contamination, if you're trying to work, you know, in a shared space, but doing work that maybe is very, very um, sensitive to contamination, which I think was, we already saw people are either working on or planning to do. Lack of personal expertise. Um, yeah, entrance criteria, COVID, yes, of course, that has been a, I think, particularly major barrier over the last year and a half. Um, so the, a lot of potential, I mean, these are not minor things. I think for a lot of us, we can really, I mean, I know I can relate to, I think, all of these. Um, uh, so with that, we're actually slightly ahead of the schedule because I've like rushed you so much, which hopefully means we'll have a chance to like actually hear from all your voices as well and do some questions, um, not just see your sticky notes as glorious as they are. But what I wanted to do, actually I can just continue screen sharing and uh, kind of, well, hopefully you don't feel tricked, but kind of that little exercise we just did um, is more or less what Nadia, um, Kelly and I worked on over the um, summer uh, to do and in, uh, uh, we did a study essentially um, uh, uh, where we interviewed the users and managers of a number of different um, community bio lab spaces um, and I'm going to actually just if I put this on um, yeah What did I just do? Hopefully that works. Um, and I'm not going to take you through every single thing in the paper, but uh, I actually feel like we kind of almost don't even need to because so many of the things that you just raised there kind of are what uh, some of the key findings from this paper. Um, and I would just, you know, I, I realize not everybody is coming from, you know, an academic. Uh, professional academic background. 
Um, and you might be wondering, like, why do you need to write a paper about these things? What even, like, you might not be aware of the fact that there is already a pretty massive body of academic literature, kind of papers published in peer reviewed journals um, about DIY bio as a kind of movement, like a socio scientific and technical movement. Um, Google Scholar finds 1,600. It's not, I mean, I think not all of those are actually real hits, but actually a really large number of them are. We're talking multiple hundreds um, of papers on DIY bio and related topics. Um, so there's a lot out there, but we also felt that there was not a lot that was grounded in particularly the material realities of work in community labs. Um, and Nadia introduced earlier human computer interactions. And so we wanted to basically be able to introduce community labs to that particular academic uh, field, um, who, where we felt like there could be a lot of great grounds for future um, collaborations and productive work between kind of academics within human computer interactions and people working in community biospaces um, and, and kind of explore what the material realities are and think about what those kind of suggest in terms of challenges and opportunities for people who are kind of who design interactive systems, whether that's software or machines or other kinds of systems. Um, uh, so yeah, I think I just explained kind of what we wanted to know. We went out and we interviewed people because of COVID. It was all just done over Zoom. Um, and we collected data from uh, 11 people who uh, represent seven different labs. Um, and we also kind of gleaned just some information that's publicly available on lab websites, particularly in terms of like what equipment is available. Um, and what we learned, I think I'll just briefly summarize, we learned, we asked people about their motivations. I think we, it was a lot of the things were already raised. There were also some things like just the kind of joy of teaching and curiosity. Um, that came up a lot and people's just desire to have a, a communal social experience. Um, uh, and a, a common refrain that came up for literally every person that we talked to was that no matter what their particular motivations or the particular project work that they were doing, that they felt that there was nowhere else available to them where they could do that work. Um, so community labs are very important to the people that use them. Um, we asked people about the kind of resources and limitations on those resources. Um, and again, you know, I think probably, I mean, definitely the issues of money and time and space, all three of those just came up just now. So that's probably going to be no surprise. Um, what we did find um, was that lab equipment was not a big um, issue for most of the people we talked to um, and, and we did the only labs we talked to were in the US and UK um, and were all in big cities that have like biotech industries so I think that's a big caveat here is that like and all of those labs felt that they it was not hard for them to get access to high-end lab equipment um, and also that it wasn't necessarily hard to get access to people who have um, relevant technical knowledge and skills, but as I'll get to in a second, just because those people exist in the community doesn't mean that those knowledge and skills are kind of available to everyone who needs them when they need them. Um, and in terms of, yeah, what activities are people doing? Um, yeah, as we, I think we just saw just now, people are doing pretty cutting edge molecular biology work as well as other kinds of bio work. Um, this is really demanding stuff. Um, and but in terms of, we also asked not first about the kind of project work, but whether people integrated, whether people made stuff, basically made any of the tools they used. And we found quite a diversity of responses there. That, um, and one of the things that I think, you know, shouldn't be a big surprise is that if a lab was co-housed within a makerspace or had some existing strong relationship with a makerspace, then they were much more likely to have stuff within the lab space that had been made by users and was actually being used. And there was a lot more just general integration of maker activities into um, work in the lab. Um, but then there were also quite a few people we talked to who had never, that just wasn't something they would did or had any particular interest in, um, in the near term. And yeah. Uh, and then in terms of the challenges and concerns, um, I think some of these already came up. Um, but the 
some of the things, I mean, particularly the managers we spoke to, safety um, is a major concern. Um, we had people, I think this basically relates to time um, and expertise is that people just found it hard to coordinate cooperative work and to manage the logistics of complex workflows. Um, and it's kind of hard for people to work out, like just to find the time to do these things, like get everyone together to plan when you're going to do a particular piece of work, but also just to know the best ways that you can work together and have systems to support that. Um, and kind of come like, I think a consequence of that is that actually there were some people who are sort of frustrated by the lack of outlets for their expertise. That there are people who have lots of skills and would love to be able to contribute them, but don't really know how to. Um, and while they're maybe in the exact same lab, there might be other people who desperately feel like they don't have the available expertise for the project work that they want to do and they don't really know how to get it um, or have time to really like do the necessary learning. Um, yeah, and so that was like a very, very brief overview. Um, and I would just say that like we did, we just found out they got rejected from this year's conference, but we were writing this for a conference, which is how uh, human computer interactions tends to work. It's not so much just journals you submit to any time of the year. Um, and so there's not like an equivalent of bio archive as well, but I'd be very happy to share the like full draft of the current paper um, if you are uh, interested. Also, we'll probably end up having to do a bit more work. So if anyone's interested in talking about um, your work, if you've already you use a community bio lab, definitely be interested in that. Um, but I wanted to, okay, I'm going to stop screen sharing for a second. Um, and yeah, I think just breathe for a minute and it'd be cool if anyone has any questions or comments on anything so far before we use the remaining time where we're going to do, I'm going to challenge all of you to become inventors uh, and invent something in like 15 minutes. We'll see how that works. Yeah. Do you have any questions about the, the study that we did or about human computer interactions or anything that has come so far? We seem to have a very quiet group right now. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I don't want, because I know I'm sort of rattling through things and I don't want you to feel too. Uh, sort of rushed if there was something that you were just totally confused about or wanted to share that had maybe come into your mind so far. Because um, if not, then we have a bit more time to do what was already going to be a very tight squeeze exercise, which is maybe not a bad thing. Um, and maybe actually have time at the end to like look at the pro resulting products. So maybe we can do delve into that. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm going, I'll just, I'll go back to sharing, uh, I can, I'll share my screen, but this is going to be an exercise where if you don't have access to the Google Jamboards, this might be, um, a little, um, like you, you're going to have to access the Jamboard if you want to do the exercise as intended. Although also if you don't, I'm going to basically be giving you a bunch of different prompts and feel free to just sort of like think about them for yourselves or if you have like a pad of paper you could work on that. The jam board was really just so that we can then like see what people have come up with. Um, and I remember that I'm going to share my screen with the like prompts in a slide deck. Um, and I'll again share the link to the jam board if you kind of lost it. But so you'll work in that. I'll be telling you what you're doing and you're going to be given um, basically like six different prompts to work through and at the end of it you're going to have invented something um that's the idea so just a second um you share the jamboard link again first should i get you even to the right page yeah So link shared again in the chat, and then I'm going to share my uh, screen. Uh, 
Um, yeah, so this is the 10 minute inventor challenge that we actually have slightly more than 10 minutes for, which is good because I haven't actually run this before. So <laughs> I'm not sure if this is gonna be feasible, but you should see in the Google Jamboards, if you're there, um, also if I linked, if you follow the link I just shared, it will take you right to page eight, which is currently the um, the final page or final frame in the Jamboard. But you will notice that if you just click the little chevron that's pointing right, um, you can just add a new frame. And what I want you to do, and I'm gonna stop sharing in a second so I can check how this is working and intervene if it's chaos. You can add your own frame and then add your name to it or in other, in some other way indicate that you've basically claimed it because I want everyone who wants to participate to have their own frame. Um, yeah. This one here, I'm just gonna go along and see. Okay, cool. I see that there's been a bunch of new frames created, perfect. And hopefully it doesn't crash with everybody working on it at the same time. Um, it shouldn't do. Good. So once you've created a new frame um, and you've added your name, if you want to, you don't have to. Um, I want you to pick a goal that's going to going to broadly shape what your invention is going to be for. Um, and I have suggested a few that were informed by our research, but feel free to add your own if none of these really speak to you. Um, I'm going to leave my screen on this slide for a little while so that you can, I think it would make sense to try and write down the goal in your frame, otherwise you're going to forget it. Um, let's see. Cool, cool. Good, good. I see lots of people um, in the jam boards. And again, obviously, speak up if you don't know what you're being asked to do. Here's the goals again for another minute. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next one, but please do speak up or put in the chat if you needed to see the goals again, because I can just come back to them. Uh, so identify a problem or a barrier. So you have your kind of big picture goal. Now we're going to start to narrow down. Um, so what is kind of standing in the way of that goal? Uh, and imagine, and we still, and to, if it wasn't clear, we're in, we're imagining that we're designing or inventing something for use in a community bio lab. Um, yeah. So if you've never worked in a community bio lab, please just use your imagination for what you think might be a problem. I've kind of suggested how you might frame this. So like, if your goal is to help lab users work safely, one possible problem, and this is just an example could be that new users, you know, are, don't come in familiar with lab safety standards because they are not necessarily from a professional science background. Um, uh, maybe thinking in a different direction, if your goal is you want them to be more group work happening in the lab, that most lab equipment is designed to only have a single user at any one time. So that's not very kind of cooperative. Um, and if you wanted to create opportunities for learning, maybe a problem for that would be that the machines that you use, they kind of already assume that you've done the learning beforehand. Um, and that's maybe, or kind of put it a different way that like, there's not an easy way for new users to learn how to use each piece of lab equipment, something like that. Um, there could be lots of different things, but try and See if you can take your big picture goal and, and come up with one narrow problem. And that problem is going to be what you use to, to focus the more fun steps that are coming next, which will be finding a possible solution.
cool. Yes. The the goals have been added in frame 10. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, that would have been a good idea. So if you needed them and you lost them, you can go to frame 10 in the Jamboard and you can find them again. Orlando, should we only come up with one problem, just identify one, or should we come up with multiple for the for whatever uh, goal we have? Yeah, ideally just one, unless you maybe have one problem and then you're trying to define kind of sub problems within that. Um, but we're just going to stick with having one problem for now. And I think hopefully everyone's had a chance to do that um, because the next prompt, like now you have a, a goal and you have a problem. We're going to think we're going to start to just sort of think more about what you could what you could invent that at least should relate in some way. Probably for most of the problems, it's not like you're going to invent something that's just going to completely solve it, but will relate to and provide um, some way of uh, addressing that problem. Um, I should also add that some of these problems, you could also just reframe them as opportunities. They're really just two sides of the same coin. Um, and so think about the, now specify the core features of your invention. Here you're gonna have to just jump a lot because it might be hard to directly relate from your problem to like what exactly should, should you make that could relate to that. Um, and might be a little bit more just like, what's something that you kind of um, think is, fun and interesting um and the two what i thought could be two useful questions would be like what work does your your invention do um and i when i say work i mean that like very very broadly um so it could be that its work is providing information it could be counting bacteria it could be scheduling lab tasks turning plant fibers into paper it could be providing something kind of aesthetically intriguing that inspires people. I mean, work could be a lot of different things. Um, and then I want you to particularly think about the way that people might use it or interact with it. Um, so imagine whatever this nascent idea is that's forming in your head, particularly imagine somebody trying to interact with it and what that user experience might look like. And like just to find like what would that ideally look like for you um, and this could be at this point you can't like really define all of these things but you might be able to come up with some key words like um curiosity or um tactile or things like that um uh, yeah so in terms of user experience some some sub prompts could be like is it something that you access online does it is it something that has some sort of touch interface is it something that is very complex or are you imagining something that's very simple, that's very accessible? Um, how many human senses does it engage? Um, yeah, hopefully that gives you at least some things you can start to uh, work with.
Yeah, I'm going to give you the final prompt, but then I'm also going to go like go back through everything in case there was something you missed. Um, and I think because we're like reasonably good on time, then we'll have a bit more time to just like work on your little inventions and be able to actually anyone who's interested to share what they came up with. I realized I should have done a like, here's one I made earlier in case no one wants to share. But, um, yeah, so the final thing, if you already um, come up with some responses to kind of what work it is that your invention does um, and how people might interact with it is to give it some, give it a bit more form. Um, and two particular prompts in this direction would be to um, kind of think about physical form and then a name, which is often one of the like key tools we can use to provide people with um, some kind of evoke some idea of what it is that we're um, trying to achieve with our invention. Um, so in terms of giving it physical form, um, hopefully you should be comfortable using like the pen tool and the other tools in Google Jamboards and you could try your artistic hand at trying to um, sketch out whatever is kind of, even if it's something very vague and it's just some little evocative shape. Um, or maybe scour the internet and try and type in some keywords that are kind of coming into your mind and see if you can find some existing things that would that you would kind of look to for inspiration and paste them um, into your Jamboard. I think that works. Um, and yeah, so try and give it some sort of either like doodle something um, or look for some existing inspiration, kind of like a mood board um, and try to come up with a name. Um, and I'll just, I'll come back to this page, but I'll just run back through again. If you were like, oh, I got lost somewhere in the middle of that. We are coming up with a goal, which are in frame 10 of the Jamboard. Um, we are identifying a problem or a barrier that might stop people being able to uh, achieve that goal. If they wanted to work in a community bio lab, we were coming up with some idea for our invention of it does some sort of work um, and people interact with it. What does that interaction look like? What does that work? And this could be, maybe you have some fully fleshed out idea, maybe just some words pop into your mind. Um, and then we're giving it form with some sort of doodle or existing uh, pictures of things that already exist. And we're gonna give it a name. And I'm gonna give, yeah, I think of like five minutes to continue working on that. I mean, I'll check in a second, like where people are at in the jam boards to see if everyone's kind of stuck, but um, take five minutes to continue working on that. And then we'll come together and I'll ask like anyone who um, would like to, to share, I particularly encourage anyone who so far has not been, not shared anything today um, to take the opportunity to speak up and it really, like even if all you came up with was like one word or just like a question, um, I'd love to hear from it. And you, what I think what I could do is like, if you say which frame yours was, I can just screen share there for people who have not got access to the jam boards to, to show that. Um,
Okay, I was just looking for the jam board because I was worried that like everyone might have been completely thrown, but already I can see like a lot of amazing creative things that are like far more creative than what I think I would be able to come up with in like five minutes. But yeah, still take a couple more minutes before we start sharing. And I guess if you're like really in into it, you can just continue working on it. Um, I guess I'd say before I forget, I was thinking, yeah, to share this um, through the Biosummit Slack. Um, it might even maybe make sense to like download it as a PDF version, um, because otherwise anyone at any point can just come in and like wipe what's there. Um, but if there's any reason, like if you decide that you what you came up with is very personal and you don't want that shared, just delete your frame at the end and it won't be. But hopefully. Uh, that won't be the case. I mean, you don't have to put your name on anything as well. Okay, I'm going to share my screen again um, to to go to the Google Jamboard and I'd like to ask for anyone who's willing to please just like unmute. Um, feel free to like introduce yourself as well in any um, anything you'd like to share. And if you tell me like which frame your invention is on, I can just navigate to that. And if there's anything that you'd like to explain about what you came up with. Um, or anything that maybe a, like thoughts that came to you in the process. Um, be, I'd love to hear from you all. Um, if you feel, if you don't feel like up to speaking, but you wanted to share, you can just like put in the chat which frame yours is and I can navigate there as well. Uh, yeah, anyone wanna volunteer? I'm happy to volunteer. Woo. Yeah, I, I believe I'm frame 18. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. So yeah, I um, the challenge I think uh, here was just creating this opportunity for learning. And um, as, by the way, I'm Chaz Childers. I, I uh, currently reside in New York City. I work for Opentron's uh, programming robots and um yeah I, I think that uh there's this movement to automate a lot of uh you know lab work protocols things like that uh but i want to create an opportunity for learning so i do think that there is some opportunity to learn how to automate certain things but i also think that there are certain uh some people who come into the space who don't have any of the wet lab experience so uh what i was hoping to do is sort of bridge that gap between the sort of the hands-on wet lab biologist and the person that exists solely in the, the computer side of things. So uh, the core features here, I mean, these were just like sort of ideas, but uh, you're using a programming to do some part of it, but you're also <laughs> required to do uh, manually intervene uh, and perform some part of the protocol. And I wanted there to be some sort of tangible output whether it's uh, you know bacteria, yeast, um, something, and so I uh, called this form the computer-aided protocol executor or CAPE, 
And I, I made a little illustration there. Uh, you see the computer uh, next to pipettes uh, and then a little dish. I, don't, I, don't, I really don't know, it was a tough challenge uh, in the 10 or so minutes, but this is what I, what I came up with. Thank you. I actually feel like that is, I'm really impressed with your drawing. Maybe like, um, yeah, like particularly the use of colors. And I think this is really like, I don't know, you know, this is like, I give you so little time, but I think it's really interesting because I think there's within the existing um, human computer interactions literature, like there's a few, um, I can't remember what the name, what lab group it was, but kind of was working on creating kind of interactive um, bench top systems for use in professional bio labs that kind of like provide a sort of partially digital interface that interacts with you while you're performing lab work at the bench. But like, I don't know if anything um, really happened from that. Um, and uh, I mean, I think something that just kind of occurred, like that I didn't talk about, but I think was what I hope could be some inspiration from this exercise is just like, whilst I think it's cool that there are like academic researchers interested in designing systems that maybe people can use in bio labs or working with bio labs. I think we have like a huge amount of creativity and expertise within the community. Um, and uh, community bio labs are these spaces that like, I think we focus a lot on the, the challenges and the difficulties, but that also means like that's opportunity to come up with cool and creative solutions that maybe we can actually build ourselves. Um, and, oh, I see in the, cool. Anyone else wanna share? I really like that. You can also, if you just wanna put in the chat, if you don't wanna speak, but you want people to kind of sh show off what you did. Or if you just want to ask a question or provide a reaction, so that's also fine. Okay, uh, Kelly has asked that I read has on slide eleven. Um, cool. So we've got a uh, squawker. Um, a flying bird robot that supervises all projects and squawks safety advice at lab users. <laughs> um, I think that there's a lot of really cool images here. I think I'm particularly um, drawn to this, what looks kind of like a Cyberman type. Um, I'm getting a kind of menacing vibe. Um, I think anyone who's been like a lab manager might relate to this robot. Um, and it's, um, yeah, there's a problem that lab users don't realize when they're not following a safety rule. Like it's it's fine to just say like, we have these rules and they exist. Um, and like maybe at some point you've done a training, but that doesn't mean you're always going to uh, to um, uh, actually follow them. So yeah, um, so Squawker, it responds to voice commands. It can answer questions. It acts as a little mascot. Um, it could be terrifying and annoying um, and cannot take the place of human supervision or expertise. Uh, and it could escape and become our new robot overlord. Um, so some pros and cons there. Love it. Anyone else? We actually only got like a couple of minutes, but I'd love to hear if there's anyone else who wanted to share or have me go to what they did. Um, David, <laughs> did you want to share? I wasn't sure you put message in the chat. Did you want me to go to a particular slide? Hello. Hello. You hear me? Yeah, I think so. I'm going to try, but my connection is 
dropping. So if I get lost in the middle, let me, excuse me if, if it happens. Mine is uh, 11, I think. This is 11. Yeah, you, see. this, yeah? Yeah, this one. Cool. So, my idea was to um, tell the community um, providing the uh, and give it to the people so the people can, can learn how to do it and then share the product or sell the product that they know. And that's basically the main idea. And the problem would be to um, connect everybody who's. I mean, the university and the lab of their project. And so then we need to create a very engaging documentation to convince them uh, to actually make it real. And oh. I think we finally lost your connection. But um, I mean, thank you for, for sharing this. And I think also, hopefully, people can actually read. Um, on screen and so this is helping the community provide equipment and training and this kind of internet of things yogurt bioreactor um i think there's so many kind of exciting things that we can do like something uh i wanted to maybe just quickly end on um yeah because the time is up it would be just that my background is not i mean my background is as a biologist there's actually, I've been learning some of the basics of how to make use of digital fabrication and kind of electronics. Um, there are so many amazing things that are already out there in terms of um, open source hardware and software projects that are easy to get started with and you can use to create some of these, give some life to um, some of these inventions. Um, and I hope that that was in some way inspiring and please definitely like, Message me on the Slack, I guess would be the easiest way if you are um, interested, if you wanted to see the full paper, like that's currently, I guess, a draft and or wanted to connect about anything from today's workshop. But otherwise, thank you very much for coming in and entertaining this slightly crazy enterprise. Thank you so much. Uh, can we have a round of applause for, uh, this was probably the most engaging uh, workshop of the day. Uh, Thank you. We will yeah, have an yeah. amazing rest of Bio Summit. Hopefully, hopefully. Uh, let's uh, keep the conversation going in the Slack. Uh, do not, this was the, the last session of uh, today's in the uh, workshop session uh, in the chloroplast. Uh, do you can hop uh, pop over between the uh, different workshops that are uh, the different tracks that are going on uh, and uh, at seven we have uh, the nucleus uh, do not forget to come to the closing wrap up session uh, in the nucleus thanks everyone